on the record still, but uh, we just put it for purposes of the record. And we're on uh, KCAC 21-8997, Strong Arm Productions USA, Alvis Celsius Holdings, Inc. Uh, look, Director Fleck, the are all present, the uh, partners are all present, and uh, we have all our jurors. Anything to pick up for the print I, I would ask, uh, instead of 75, um, 15 to 80, uh, sorry, 70 to 20. Okay. And while we're talking, can I move the podium and kind of get ready? Oh, yes. Still five minute warning on the front? Yes, please. And a minute on rebuttal? Yes. And still 90 minutes? No. Not even close, Judge. Uh, maybe. I hope not for either. No. Maybe 30, 35 minutes top, two minute warning. Anyway, you have 90 if you want. Thank you, Judge. Both sides have 90 minutes. All right. Your Honor, during the break, we have a couple of uh, exhibits that we can read into the record. Um, we've already talked with the clerk and the opposing counsel. I think I have a couple, and uh, Ms. Okay. Vicente has a couple. One is exhibit uh, plaintiff's 291, and the other one is plaintiff's 249. All right, great. Agreed, Your Honor. And then since? Um, we inserted defendant's 386, and uh, what was originally plaintiff's 24 is now defense exhibit 387. And Plaintiff's counsel has copies of everything. All right, agree? Yes. I'm sorry? They're all in evidence now? They're all in evidence. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Um, all right. Let me do this. Um, all right. Um, so, Sal, if you need to move around at all to say any of these things, uh, feel free to. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have you seen everything? On? Seated. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Everybody have a nice long weekend. Uh, relaxed. Uh, good night's sleep. There you go. And I got your coffee. Good, good breakfast as well. All right. Here we go. What we're going to do is I have some instructions to read, and then we're going to go into uh, closing arguments, and then we're going to send you back to uh, deliberate. 
Um, actually, let me ask, uh, during the long weekend, did everyone follow my instructions not to discuss the case without the case discussed in your presence and not to do any investigation of your own? Yes. Right. So, uh, um, you will have a, a written set. These instructions, you'll get a copy of these when you go back to, uh, to deliberate. You will have all the exhibits with you when you go back to deliberate as well as the first one. All right? So here we go. Your Honor, one, before we begin, just a reminder for the people in the, in, in the, in the gallery that please no photographs or video of the jurors. Okay. I, they should all be aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Everybody else is okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, here we go. Members of the jury, you, you have now heard and received all of the evidence in this case. I am now going to tell you about the rules of law that you must use in reaching your verdict. When I finish telling you about the rules of law, the attorneys will present their final arguments and you will then retire to decide your verdict. <coughs> Under count one, plaintiffs claim that they and defendant entered into a 2014 endorsement agreement. Plaintiffs claim that the defendant breached this contract by failing to transfer shares of defendant's stock pursuant to two provisions of the contract. The first provision relates to the bonus compensation of 250,000 shares, and the second provision relates to the incentive compensation of 500,000 shares. Plaintiffs claim that these breaches resulted in damages to plaintiffs. Defendant denies that it breached the 2014 endorsement agreement. Defendant also claims plaintiffs waived their claims by failing to demand compensation sooner and that the claims were untimely filed under the statute of limitations. Under count two, plaintiffs claim that they and defendant ent entered into a 2016 endorsement agreement. Plaintiffs claim that defendant breached this contract by failing to pay royalties due to plaintiffs and that this breach resulted in damages to plaintiffs. Defendant denies that it breached the 2016 endorsement agreement and claims that no additional royalties are due. The parties must prove their claims by the greater weight of the evidence. I will now define some of the terms you will use in deciding this case. If the greater weight of the evidence does not support one or more of plaintiff's claims, your verdict should be for defendant on those claims. However, if the greater weight of the evidence supports one or more of plaintiff's claim, then your verdict should be for plaintiffs and against defendant on those claims. Greater weight of the evidence means the more persuasive and convincing force and effect of the entire evidence in the case. To recover damages from defendant for breach of contract, plaintiffs must prove all of the following. One, plaintiffs and Celsius Holdings, Inc. entered into a contract. Two, plaintiffs did all or substantially all of the essential things which the contract required them to do, or they were excused from doing those things. Three, all conditions required by the contract for Celsius Holdings, Inc.'s performance had occurred. Four, Celsius Holdings, Inc. failed to do something essential which the contract required it to do. And five, plaintiffs were damaged by that failure. Plaintiffs and defendant dispute the meaning of terms and provisions in the contracts. Plaintiffs must prove that their interpretation of the terms is correct. In deciding what the terms of a contract mean, you must decide what the parties agreed to at the time the contract was created. In order to determine what the parties agreed to, you should consider the plain and ordinary meaning of the language used in the contract, as well as the circumstances surrounded, surrounding the making of the contract. The agreement of the parties is determined only by what the parties said, wrote, or did. You may not consider the parties' thoughts or unspoken intentions. I will now instruct you on the other methods that you should use in resolving the dispute over terms in the contract. You should assume that the parties intended the disputed terms in their contract to have their plain and ordinary meaning, unless you decide that the parties intended the disputed terms to have another meaning. Disputed terms in the contract should be given the meaning used by people in that trade, business, or technical field unless the parties agree that the disputed terms should have another meaning. In deciding what the disputed terms of the contract mean, you should consider the whole contract, not just isolated parts. 
You should use each part to help you interpret the others so that all the parts make sense when taken together. In deciding what a disputed term in a contract means, you should adopt the interpretation which results in the more reasonable and probable contract, not one that gives a party an unfair or unreasonable advantage, and avoid an interpretation leading to an absurd result. In deciding what the disputed terms of the contract mean, you should consider how the parties acted before and after the contract was created. A contract's use of different language and different contractual provisions is evidence that the parties intended a different meaning. Plaintiff, Strong Arm Productions USA Inc. and defendant, Celsius Holdings Inc. are corporations. Plaintiff, D3M Licensing Group LLC is a limited liability company. A corporation and a limited liability company are persons under the law. All persons, whether corporations, limited liability companies, or individuals, are entitled to equal treatment under the law. A corporation can act only through its agents, employees, officers, or directors. A limited liability company can act only through its agents, employees, officers, managers, or members. If you find that the plaintiffs have failed to prove any of their claims by the greater weight of the evidence, you won't consider the question of affirmative defenses. If you find that the plaintiffs proved any of their claims, then you must determine whether Celsius has proven by the greater weight of the evidence an affirmative defense for that claim. Defend Defendant Celsius Holdings, Inc. has asserted two affirmative defenses to the alleged breaches of contract. One, statute of limitations. Two, waiver. In response to the statute of limitations defense, plaintiffs have asserted two avoidances that, if proven, would allow plaintiffs to file these claims after May 4, 2016. One, fraudulent concealment. Two, equitable estoppel. On the defense of statute of limitations, the issue for you to decide in connection with plaintiff's claim for breach of the 2014 agreement only is whether plaintiffs filed these claims for breach of contract within the time set by law. To establish this defense, defendant Celsius must prove that any breach of the 2014 contract, if one in fact occurred, occurred before May 4, 2016, which is five years before the claim was filed. An avoidance to defendant's statute of limitations defense is the doctrine of fraudulent concealment. You will consider, you will only consider the fraudulent concealment avoidance if you find that the defendant proved its statute of limitations defense. If you find that defendant engaged in fraudulent concealment, then defendant's statute of limitations defense cannot succeed. To establish fraudulent concealment, plaintiffs must prove all of the following by the greater weight of the evidence. One, after defendant allegedly breached the 2014 agreement, defendant concealed a material fact concerning its breach from plaintiffs. Two, defendant owed a duty to disclose that material fact to plaintiffs. Three, defendant knew the material fact should have been disclosed to plaintiffs. Four, defendant intended to prevent plaintiffs from becoming apprised of the material facts before the statute of limitations period expired. And five, Plaintiffs detrimentally relied on the concealed material fact. Six, plaintiffs exercised reasonable care and diligence in seeking to discover the facts that form the basis of the claim. Fraudulent concealment goes beyond a defendant's mere non-disclosure of a fact. It must constitute active and willful concealment of a material fact where the plaintiffs did not have the equal opportunity to become apprised of that fact. A defendant may have a duty to disclose material facts to the plaintiffs where there is a fiduciary relationship between the parties. Fraudulent concealment stops the running of the statute of limitations only for the time between the date of concealment and the date of the plaintiff's discovery. Another avoidance to defendant's statute of limitations defense is the doctrine of equitable estoppel. You will consider the equitable estoppel avoidance if you find that defendant proved its statute of limitations defense. If you find that defendant is equitably estopped, then defendant's statute of limitations defense cannot succeed. To establish equitable estoppel, 
the plaintiffs must prove all of the following. One, after defendant breached the 2014 agreement, plaintiffs knew all material facts reflecting that defendant breached the contract. Two, defendant willfully engaged in conduct that would have reasonably caused a person not to commence a lawsuit before the statute of limitations expired. Three, defendant engaged in that contact with the con conduct, excuse me, defendant engaged in that conduct with an intent to cause plaintiffs not to commence a lawsuit before the statute of limitations expired. Four, plaintiffs relied in good faith on defendant's conduct. And five, plaintiff's reliance on defendant's conduct actually caused plaintiffs not to commence this lawsuit before the statute of limitations expired. A defendant's conduct causes a plaintiff not to commence a lawsuit only if, had the defendant not engaged in that conduct, the plaintiff would have timely commenced the lawsuit. That is, the defendant's conduct needed to actually change the plaintiff's position about whether to commence the lawsuit within the statute of limitations period. Celsius claims that it did not have to pay additional compensation because plaintiffs gave up their right to additional compensation. This is called a waiver. To establish this defense, Celsius must prove all of the following. One, plaintiff's right to have Celsius pay additional compensation actually existed. Two, plaintiffs knew or should have known that they had the right to additional compensation. And three, plaintiffs freely and intentionally gave up their right to additional compensation. A waiver may be oral or written or may arise from conduct which shows that plaintiffs gave up that right. If Celsius proves that plaintiffs gave up their right to additional compensation, then Celsius was not required to perform these obligations. If you find for defendant, you will not consider the matter of damages. But if you find for plaintiffs, you should award plaintiffs an amount of money that the greater weight of the evidence shows will fairly and adequately compensate plaintiffs for their damages. You shall consider the following types of damages. Compensatory damages. Compensatory damage is that amount of money which will put plaintiffs in as good a position as they would have been if defendant had not breached the contract and which naturally resulted from the breach. In deciding this case, it is your duty as jurors to decide the issues and only those issues that I submit for your determination. You must come to an agreement about your verdict. Your agreed upon answers to my questions are called your jury verdict. The evidence in this case consists of the sworn testimony of the witnesses, all exhibits received in evidence, and all facts that were admitted or agreed to by the parties and any fact of which the court has taken judicial notice. In reaching your verdict, you must think about and weigh the testimony and any documents, photographs, or other material that has been received in evidence. You may also consider any facts that were admitted or agreed to by the lawyers. Your job is to determine what the facts are. You may use reason and common sense to reach conclusions. You may draw reasonable inferences from the evidence. But you should not guess about things that were not covered here. And you must always apply the law as I have explained it to you. Let me speak briefly about witnesses. In evaluating the believability of any witness and the weight you will give the testimony of any witness, you may properly consider the demeanor of the witness while testifying, the frankness or lack of frankness of the witness, the intelligence of the witness, and the interest the witness may have in the outcome of the case, the means and opportunity the witness had to know the facts about which the witness testified, the ability of the witness to remember the matters about which the witness testified, and the reasonableness of the testimony of the witness considered in the light of all of the evidence in the case and in the light of your own experience and common sense. You have heard opinion testimony on certain technical subjects from persons referred to as expert witnesses. Some of the testimony before you was in the form of opinions about certain technical subjects. You may accept such opinion testimony, reject it, or give it the weight that you think it deserves, considering the knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education of the witness, the reasons given by the witness for the opinion expressed, and all the other evidence in the case. In your deliberations, you will consider and decide several distinct claims. 
plaintiffs have asserted two claims against the defendant, breach of the 2014 agreement and breach of the 2016 agreement. In addition, plaintiff's claim for breach of the 2014 agreement is based on two separate alleged breaches. Although these claims have been tried together, each is separate from the other, and you must separately consider each alleged claim of breach. Therefore, in your deliberations, you should consider the evidence as it relates to each uh, claim of breach separately, as you would have each claim been tried before you separately. There are also three plaintiffs in this case. If you end up finding that the plaintiffs have proven their case against Celsius for any one of the alleged breaches, you will not award damages to each plaintiff, but instead will award only a single amount of damages. In other words, you will award damages as if there were only one plaintiff. That is the law that you must follow in deciding this case. The attorneys for the parties will now present their final arguments. When they are through, I will have a few final instructions about your deliberations. All right, each side gets an equal amount of time for closing arguments. However, the plaintiff can break up that time between an opening closing argument and a rebuttal closing argument after the defense has given their closing argument. All right, on behalf of the plaintiff. Thank you, Your Honor. Set my own timer. Thank you for coming to the courthouse again this morning. We have a lot uh, to cover, so I can just get to it and not tell the that I might normally write at the beginning. Um, while we're getting the PowerPoint set up, um, up on the screen, the, the visuals that I want to show you, um, let me just kind of give you an overview. I was thinking on the way over to the courthouse, there's so much that has come in on so many different things, and I tried to make this closing clear, but it occurred to me to spend five minutes to just kind of have really an aerial view, what do they call it, 10,000 foot view would be helpful, okay? So what we're going to get to, I, we have up on the, on the screen the, the five questions that, that I think will, once those are answered, they will determine all the answers on the verdict form. Okay, so can you trust the data? What is co-branded revenue? Was there a renewal? What is a unit? And what is the data breach? And that's going to stay up there now for like five minutes. You don't have to rush to write it. And you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll mention it again. But, um, but before we get into the specifics, okay, so just very, very general. We have two main clauses in the contract that are at issue. Okay, and the first one, uh, two, you, uh, when we get a, you know, a few more minutes, I'm going to go through and show you in detail that page of the contract. But just for now, just so you can see, the first one, there's 250,000 shares that, um, that are due once the 1 million in revenue is reached. Okay, and it has to be during the term. That, at the, the last three words, during the term. So the very first thing you have to determine is what what is the definition of co-branded revenue? And there's a dispute between the parties. They have a different definition. Our definition includes the revenue from all the co-branded, and I'll explain that. And without a doubt, that gets you over a million dollars within the term if you accept that definition. Don't worry about the details right now, but just so you understand, the first question is, do you accept our definition of co-branded revenue? If so, there's no dispute during the term. If, on the other hand, you accept the defendant's definition of co-branded revenue, which is that it's just from sales of those flow fusion powder products, we admit it didn't occur during the initial term. It, there had to be an extension or a renewal in order for this for us to recover under this. If you accept the defendant's definition, your next question is, was there an extension and a renewal? If so, then still it's undisputed that million was met during the extension, okay? So that those are the basic questions on the first one. What is the definition of co-branded revenue? If, it's, if you accept our definition, that's the end of the story. If you accept theirs, then you have to decide, was there a renewal, and if so, it's, we still prevail. On the other issue, the 500,000 shares, okay, there's different language. Instead of co-branded revenue, it says 690,000 units of co-branded product. So 
we agree, this is the powder product, right? Those are different. And Judge instructed you, and I'll show you again, when there's different words, the assumption is, the, the general conclusion in the law is that something different was meant. That's why it was meant. That's why we use different words. So here, we admit that, that it has to be sales of those powdered units. But the, then the question becomes, what is a unit? And that's why you have to decide, was it a stick? Or as they're now saying, a box. Was it a stick or a box? If it was a stick, there's no doubt this was met immediately during the initial term. If you decide, however, a unit meant something else other than a stick, you have to decide the deadline question. Okay? Because there's no doubt 690,000 units were sold through retail, through the distribution at retail, but it took longer if it's not sticks. And so the, the, the first one says during the term, right? These have to be met during the term, either the first term or if it was extended the full term. But this one, in the negotiations, we negotiated not to have that word during the term. So what does that mean? And so even if you find that units are not sticks, they're boxes or cases or something else, the 690,000 was still met, and you have to decide, is there a deadline in that clause, even though if there's no words suggesting it, right? That's the defense. There's still a deadline in there, even though the words are in there. So I hope that gives you kind of an overview of what you have to decide. Now let's, let's get into the, the uh, evidence a little bit. Um, I'm still going to give you a little more overview of the contract. Not as detailed as I did on the first two clauses, but I, the judge said you have to read the whole contract as one. And you'll have the contract back there. It's very illuminating to sit and read the whole thing. But we don't have, I probably would have taken a day to, for somebody to read it to you. But you'll have it back there and your deliberations will last as long as you want. You'll have all the evidence. You can look at anything that was put into evidence. And you should if you have a question about it. Um, so I want to talk about a few other terms in the contract. So the first thing is, on the first page, the, they, the, they, the parties agree there is something that's already being sold, the core products. And there is essentially, Jerry David said, those are the ready to drink cans, right, the cans. But in addition, they say, we're going to create something new. And that's the uh, second clause we highlighted that. And that's where they define products. Products is a defined term. Whenever you see the word product in the contract, you know what it means. It's these, um, the powder products, the new products. So they invented a new formulation, and there's evidence proving that without a doubt, which if there's any dispute about that in the defendant's closing, I'll point you to that evidence in my rebuttal so you can go look at it. There's no doubt that they formulated a new powder <coughs> Right? If I open these up and pour them out, there's powder in there. It's not just taste. They have claims on it and negative powder. This was a new powder that was invented when they did this licensing endorsement um, and branding deal. So this new product, this product, and it's a powder product. It's not in a can. was created. Um, the term. Okay, so you're going to have to decide if you accept their definition. You may not even get to this, but if you accept the de their definition of co-branding, then you have to decide the term. The term um, is defined. It's an initial term of two years. And then, if it's mutually extended by the parties in writing, the extended term, together with the initial term, is the term. Right? So when we go back to the key... Uh, the key clause, any 12 month period during the term, there is no doubt the contract makes it absolutely clear the term of the contract includes any extension. Okay. Um, this is the, the uh, part of the contract, the page, just to take these and go further out so you can see what's above them and where they fit into the contract. So, um, they talk about a million shares. Million shares. The first 250 would be given immediately. Then 
there would be an additional 250, which we're talking about, and then in addition to that, um, and, uh, 500 when um, the 690,000 units are sold. So these are the two we just went through. There, right in the contract it says, the language in all parts of this agreement shall in every case be construed according to fair meaning. I think that's important because the judge just instructed you something similar. If the contract says it, right, so renewal can't mean something that it doesn't mean, right, words can't have, when it, if the company documents say unit when they're talking about sticks, they, they can't invent a new definition just for argument, okay? It's the fair meaning of the normal English language words. All right. Now, I give you two of these, a big one and a little, a little bit more detail. But I apologize for that, but I really think you need to understand the contract in order to answer these questions. Can we trust the data? Why do I start with that? The reason I start with that is, um, it, it pertains to every question, every other question, right? Because that's the data we're looking at. So, uh, there, it, basically, as far as I can tell, there are two. There are two basic defenses to um, to uh, to whether we met the benchmarks. Okay, and the first is the product failed so miserably it wasn't even close. That that's the first one, um, and. The second one is we did give reports, but we gave them verbally, right? We didn't give written reports, but we gave them verbally. If, if it would fail so miserably that it wasn't even close, we didn't need to give reports, right? We didn't even need to check the data because it was so obvious that it didn't meet the benchmarks. That, that seems to be one of the, the defenses. And the second one being, well, we did do the reports, but we did them verbally. So let's look at those two uh, Reasons for not having, because remember, I read to you during the trial, their sworn answers. There are, they never ran, there's no written reports, there's no email, there's no anything ever where they said, hey, I wonder if we met that 690,000 benchmark. I wonder if we met the million. We, we, we have to calculate it. They, they don't, there's no way. If they say, I'm going to get to this about waiver and everything like that. Like, how could we possibly have been doing this math? Or we don't have the invoices, anything like that. So, so, um, so they admit there's no record anywhere of them actually checking about whether the benchmarks are met. I think in in opening, I, I helped this up. Right. This is this is the analysis they did. So um, it was actually a juror question. Why? why didn't Celsius, I think that's a typo there, why didn't Celsius provide any flow fusion related reports to D3M, the, the, to the CEO at the time the contracts were in? And the basic answer was, there was more before that, but it ended with John Fieldley, the current CEO, and the CFO at the time, would be better served to answer that. So then, the, the, a similar question was asked, asked by a juror. The lawyers probably should have asked it of him, to after the first question, but neither lawyer did. But again, we had a juror question. And this is the answer. I was saying, you know, with David Gold, I mean, it's constant, uh, always in communication. So, I mean, it was in the office every other week, a couple times, uh, phone calls, always uh, either trying to sell something or, you know, or wanting, to, wanting a royalty check or payment. And we were always talking about sales, so it was no surprise that sales were underperforming on Flow Fusion. And like I said, we actually brought him on as a sales rep to help kind of drum up sales, and um, you know, we just wound up having to write a lot of it off. So because it, 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 it basically expired. So let, let's look at that question in detail, uh, that answer in detail for a minute. First of all, it doesn't answer the question. Why didn't you just send one email over the course of this whole time? And by the way, think about it. First email that came that said, oh, this is how many boxes were sold. If you believe that's what the email would have said, the parties would have known. Wait a minute. It's supposed to be sticks. This would have been dealt with in 2015. But no, it was not such an email. 
And I, I think I'm, and I can prove to you in a bit that the email, if it ever was sent, would have said, here's how many sticks were sold out of the 690,000. But there is no email. So first thing is, he didn't answer the question. Second thing is, he has both of the defenses kind of buried in that answer. Well, it was failed. This is a failed product, so we didn't need a report. And secondly, David Gold was in the office a lot, so I, me I mentioned it to him, which, by the way, is not showing the data. When, when before this lawsuit was brought, we requested the data. And there, you'll see it in the evidence. I'm going to show it to you, but it's in back in there, their response. Won't we'll give the data. Is it reasonable that they would have been giving the data all along if when they get a written request to data, for the data, they won't give it? Um, but anyway, he's got both of those in there. Um, and then um, he goes back to the failed product. And there is truth to that. It is true. This product failed. And they discontinued it. They don't sell this anymore. It happened very quickly. But the thing is, every time during the trial, when somebody was talking about we needed to destroy the lot numbers. It wasn't selling. The, the, the lot numbers expired. We had to take it back. We had to destroy it. It was always this. Sold for $50. Maybe there was a business mistake in selling this for $50 next to a, a, a similar size can of Gatorade powder, which sells for a six or something. But for whatever reason, doesn't matter. It failed. The thing is, this was a great success. So you have to be careful whenever you have in your notes or your memories or anything about failed product, what was the product of failed? Um, we're still talking about can we trust the data. So this is the response um, when we requested the data from, and this is in evidence as Plaintiff's 88, they'll have it back there. Um, and that we got a response from a lawyer. With fair, fair enough. Uh, but the lawyer says the million dollar revenue benchmark was never met. The highest gross total sales of new co-branded flow fusion products in any 12 month period was 827,999. Remember, they all, they all admit if there was an extension, it did reach a million. But now they're talking about in this answer, there was no extension. But wait a minute, that's not so obvious that you don't have to run a report. Okay, if you're talking about a million dollars over different 12 month periods in a 12 month term, you know so obviously you don't even have to run a report when we're talking about the difference between a million and 827. No, a report should have been run. The reason why I bring that up is if it's that close, it's very important whether you can trust the data. Um, in the same letter, they say, Celsius did not separately track sales figures for Flow Fusion. Okay, that's the first point. That there's problems with this data. They didn't even, there is no data. That what they're doing is looking at other things and trying to extrapolate and guess because they didn't do it at the time. So that's not right. It should have been done at the time, and then we would have the data, and it's not. I asked the CEO, at the time these contracts were written, <coughs> Jerry David, is it right, is it a violation of the contract not to keep the data and then use that as an excuse to say we don't know? And he said, no, we would never do that. Okay, so don't let them do that. Um, their own expert, I asked, you know there were errors in the data. I saw certain omissions or due dates that would say, you know, with an error in it, but I don't know to what extent there were other errors. I think a jury even asked him, what about the raw data? And I, I should have included that. Because, you remember what he said? He said, I didn't look at that. That's not my role. That's not what they asked me to do. I am a forensic accountant. They didn't ask me to do any forensic accounting. Um, I asked him, anyone who went into the data and said, how many tubs did we sell? The data is kind of worthless. It's off by 50. And then I realized my math, you know, Depending on how you do it, half or double, it's 100% off, and he just says it needed to be corrected. Um, get into a more detail. The, there's not, he's guessing. There's nothing in there identified as flow fusion. So when they say 827,000, 
and we rely on the same data, it's a guess, and that's not right. It should have been, it was meant. If you look at all the different little bits of data that, that are missing, that, like the 50 count boxes, which I'll get to, or not in the data at all, add the 50 count boxes, that probably puts it over alone without all the other, uh, without all the other problems. Um, all right, here's another thing that I want you, because again, can we trust the data? Because if you can't trust the data, if you know that the data is higher than they're telling you, then even under their own definition of co-branded revenue, a million in sales just of this and this, we met. Um, so the law firm says, Flow Fusion powered stick products sold slightly better than the, than the because they had just at the top scale, which was true. Uh, but were discontinued in 2016 after consumer demand failed to meet expectations. That is not true. Here's the, the label, and this only came, I only realized this because we started talking about labels with the CEO. He started to try to say that, that this this skew, and we'll get to this, on here was from the label company who sells 5,000 or 10,000 of these at a time and puts it as if they're selling each one of these to Celsius and saying, here's a label, pay us one-tenth of a cent. Here's another label, pay us one-tenth of a cent. Obviously, this is not a unit from the uh, packet maker to Celsius. But when we had that discussion and Chromatic came up, I looked at the document, and right there, a year after they say they canceled Flow Fusion, July 19, 2017, they're ordering Flow Fusion stick packs. That alone shows we met the threshold in the first term, even under their definition, because it's not true that they discontinued it in 2016. Um, this is in evidence as plans 133, the quarterly financial reports of the company. Um, you can look at this, it's a big document, it's a little hard to find, but uh, quarterly financial reports contain misstatements, the misstatements were material, signed by John Fieldley who testified. In other words, they're admitting they got problems in their data, they admitted it publicly uh, to the stock market. Um, and in fact, they took a $7 million quarterly profit and re realized it was an $8 million loss. Okay, so we're talking about significant problems in the video. Um, and, and that's plaintiff's 133. Um, all right, so now let's get to co-branded revenue. I am now going to use their data, okay? Because even with their data, we still need all these benchmarks. But I went through all that because if you don't trust the data even a little bit, if you think it's a little bit higher, then the, there's a little bit missing, and you have massive evidence that there was, we met all the benchmarks, even under their own definition. And it's for you to decide if using their definitions, and the data has certain mi things missing in it, and it brings it just below the threshold from a million to 820 something, uh, why that is. All right, so now let's get to co-branded revenue. Again, uh, we're talking about co-branded revenue for the 250,000 shares because we have to meet a million dollars within a 12-month period during the term in co-branded revenue. Now, the first thing I want you to I want you to understand, I had planned but, uh, to do this, but this particular courtroom is not the... the um, ideal for this, but to have these on two different sides, okay? So we got the 500,000 and we got the 250. This one talks about sales at retail to customers, right? 690,000 customers, or sales to customers, because I'll show you, they're talking about 230,000 customers and 690,000 retail sales um, of the product of the co-branded product. But this uses a different term. Co-branded revenue. What is the difference? They use different words. What could possibly be the difference between the sales of the co-branded product and co-branded revenue? That's why this is important. Because if it, it's already so close just with sales of the co-branded product, just using this definition, 
But when that, if that definition is different and a little more expansive, then it's easily met. So, not the same words, not the same thing, just pulling out what I just told you, but doing it visually. One talks about co-branded revenues during the term. The other one is units of co-branded product without a deadline. You will not understand why the parties use different words if you think of them both in terms of money. And you'll, you saw slides from the defense in the opening statement. You saw uh, some slides they used with their expert talking about both of these in terms of money. But they're not. One of them specifically talks about money, and that's what it's about, money to the company. This one, though, so I call it the revenue clause. This one, though, is specifically about unit sales to customers. It's about customers. And I'll, it's all in evidence, but I'll put it together. Why they wanted a different benchmark that had to do with how many new customers. So just keep in mind, when we're talking about this slide, we're talking about customers. This slide is about revenue, and we're going to do revenue. Um, the judge instructed you on this, just to remind you, it's not considered a coincidence in the law when the parties use different words. It's evidence they intended something different. All right, what did they intend different? Um, the powders are co are what the in the bottom of this little um, demonstrative aid, we see the sales of powders. Okay, but what about the other things that Celsius chose to brand with flow right? That is the difference. All those other things, the things that are not the powder. This one just talks about the co-branded revenue. If they co-branded together anything else, then that is also revenue, even if it's not powder. And um, let me just go back to that. I, I, I'll say this for rebuttal if I need to, but I think you remember from the, the um, testimony, we did it so many times, uh, made too much. But um, they, 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 it wasn't just Tremar Dillard, Flo Rida choosing in the My House video on his own to put a can in there. But you have to think, why was he always thinking about the cans if it didn't, it didn't help him in any possible way? Why was he always out there with the cans? Because his understanding is consistent with the contract that it does. But not, he can't do it unilaterally. They have to choose to do it. But then officials... And there's all other things, like billboards and, and advertisements, and with him holding the can that Celsius puts out, they chose to brand with him, with his brand, other products. And that's why co-branded revenue is higher than just the sales of the powder. It's all of the revenue they got from co-branding with him. Um, and I asked uh, Jerry David, that's part of the success of this deal, right? The flow over sales. Uh, I just continually check the time because one of the problems with um, trying to do the trial fast is that I could have taken twice as long and you would the sh closing would be a lot shorter. But that would be an extra week just to have a shorter closing. But that means I've got to try to put together a bunch of things because we did the witnesses short. Um, I asked Jerry David, I, so that's part of the success of this deal, the flow over sales to ready to drink. Am I right about that? And he gave a long answer. I don't want to... Uh, it suggests he didn't. But at the end, but the yes was in there. And I went to the board somewhere I wrote yes, and then I said, I wrote yes, is that fair? And he said, uh, he said yes. Okay, so and what, why is that important, the flow over sales? It's the whole reason um, why they're giving him stock. Ownership in the company, right? It's, he's not just there to sell a few units. He's here to, there to get new customers. When you get a new customer who pays only a buck to try this and likes it, that person is likely to pick up the can. That's the whole point, the flow over. The, the single-use strategy, we've got to get them to try it for the first time. How do we do it? Flow right followers, just 1% of them. That's why we want him. And will use something that they can pay a buck for. And once they try it, 
especially if they try three times, now we have a customer. And those customers will generally switch to the can. And that's why he's holding the can a lot. But he doesn't get any benefit from the cans directly. It's from getting the new customers. But the company does. So whenever you see, and they talk about it. They're, they're, I'm going to show you, they talk about getting $17 million just once they get, sell um, uh, 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 ten, uh, ten, nine or $8 million in powder sales, it's going to be worth $17 million a year for them because of flow over. And I'll, I'll show you that. But, so flow over is critically important. It's why the contract's written this way. All right, but anyway, what is co-branded revenue? So in the years before the contract, um, and we did this with the $12.1 million uh, was what they were making before they started co-branding with him. Uh, the first year after that, they made 15.3, which is more than $3 million once they started co-branding. Okay, so that's clearly more than a million dollars. And by the way, they didn't have to choose to advertise every product with him, to co-brand every product, but they did. All the cans, all the flavors. So, um, it worked. The revenue went up. And it went up uh, even more in the second year of the contract. But here's the thing when it really paid up. Third year, because each customer keeps buying, and you get new customers, and they keep buying, and the revenue starts to skyrocket. So, um, that started in year one. That's co-branded revenue, all the revenue uh, because of the co-branding, which is the higher than the baseline before the contract. That's how we define co-branded revenue. Uh, that's an easy yes to whether he's entitled to the 250000 if you define it that way. Um, I want to tell you one other thing, though, about this, because the contract, there's so many things in the contract that... Um, Look, the contract controls, and it's our position, it feels to my clients, that they're trying to get out of the clear language of the contract. So I want to show you uh, something that was negotiated between the parties. Because remember, this says, this contract provision doesn't say a million dollars during the term. This language was added, a million dollars in any 12-month period during the term. You see how different that is? If it was a million dollars during the term, you could add up all of the revenues for the first two years, and this, it would be easily, easily met it. But this, in the contract, which you're bound by, it says during any 12-month period during the term. I just want to show you, because the contract kind of began with a little bit of a switcheroo. Um, this is between Jerry David and David Gold. What did they agree to? They agreed to 250 shares when a million in revenue was achieved. Period. Not within one year. They went within the whole two years. And then, the board of directors, that's what they approved. A million in co-branded product sales. Not a million in within one year. So, here you have the parties agree, the board of directors approves, that he's supposed to get the shares as soon as they need a million. Everyone agrees they met a million easily during the term. But that language was put in there. That's what was signed, and that's what controls. So we have to abide by that. But so did that. So did that. The language controls. If it says unit, it's a unit. Other contracts say boxes. I'll show you. This doesn't. The box, they call it a display box. It has 14 units in it. That's what they say all the time in their documents. It's 14 units in the display box. It says unit. It doesn't say box. They have to abide by that. And, but, and, and that's what was intended. This, I showed you, was not intended. Right? I don't know if a lawyer put it in or... But anyway, that's the contract in the ground by um, We showed you, though, that even if you use their definition, that it's just the power system, even though the language is different, forget about that. Even though the data is, we know missing things, even if you use their data and their definition, it was still met. And, and, and the contract language, which was not what was originally intended, even all of that in their favor. And I'm just trying to prevent confusion. I'll tell you my fear. My deepest fear here is 
this is complicated. I, I mean, it took me so long to understand this, and you guys are having to try to figure it out in days. We've been doing this for years, and lawyers are really bad at like explaining things that we already know because we think everyone knows them. So I hope I don't do that. I'm really trying to, to simplify this. Um, so it occurred to me, you might not know, even using their definition, even using the change in the contract language, even using their data, they still met this benchmark during the term if the contract was extended. Um, so I just show you, this kind of shows you that um, it, it, if gross cumulative co-branded revenue is defined the way we say, it was meant in year one. And by the way, there's an email saying, or some uh, communication from uh, the CEO to David Gold saying these benchmarks are going to easily be met, right? Well, year one. Um, but even under their definition, their data, everything for them, it's still met um, by, towards the end of the extended term. Um, <coughs> was there a renewal? Now, I think, checking time. You guys know that, right? I'm not checking text. Um, so, um, was there a renewal? I'm not going to go through all of the data, uh, uh, all the, the exhibits not data, that you've seen, testimony where they use renewal, renewal, renewal. But I do want to show you that um, something that jumped out at me, because I didn't even hear it, when um, uh, Jerry David testified to this in deposition, we played a video, and I was probably getting ready for the next witness or something like that, uh, and maybe you don't pay as much attention to videos, because who does? But he, we, he was asked in that video deposition, do you recall the conversations? Now, and now he's telling you all about these conversations. But when he was asked six months ago at his deposition, he said, I don't recall any conversations. Why? Because in my mind, it was just a continuation of the agreement. Now that's not renewal. That he used the word, if, even if renewal means renew. I mean, I'm sorry. Of course it means renew. Even if renewal means the death of the first agreement and the, a, a brand new, separate, new agreement, and renewal doesn't mean renew, he used continuation, okay? So, and that's the truth. Um, so that's the first point. Second point is um, the board of directors meetings, right? He have to be accurate, say it there. <laughs> Press releases, people go to jail, they get those wrong. That's what he said. Those have to be accurate. Um, so, so I, I, it's it's all through in, in things that have to be after the people go to jail. And even he said it himself that it's a continuation. But I do want to talk very uh, specifically about one part of the 2016 contract. Okay, and I think there's some room for confusion here. Um, and in the opening statement. Um, is this, is this too low? Let me see. I can raise this if it's too low. Okay. All right. So, in opening statement, I talked about this, and I read it to you, but I guess I read it too quickly because counsel, in her opening statement, said I was trying to skip over uh, some of the language. Um, and the specific language she said I was trying to skip over was um, D3M, the second and last sentence. So this is in the 2016 contract, the renewal, the extension, okay? But it has this language in here that says, this is the entire agreement. And um, it <coughs> supersedes, um, in, in regard to the subject matter, okay, the entire agreement in regard to the subject matter, um, it's intended to expand, modify, or supersede, right? So that's what it did to the 2014, it actually expanded it. Um, but all the term sheets between the parties and, you know, the, like, for example, I just showed you how we have an agreement by email approved by the board of directors, but that's so sad, too bad, because of this language, right? The emails are big dead. doesn't matter what you intend. This is the final fruit of the negotiations. That's what this means in standard language. Lawyers put it in. The idea that this language in the 2016 contract would somehow eliminate, without actually saying, the two biggest clauses where they said he's going to get, he's going to be a 1% owner in the company, he's going to get them, and it would eliminate that, 
without actually saying it, it would just be buried in some standard uh, lawyer language, is not plausible. Okay? But, um, but it also says one other thing, this, the second to last sentence. Deedram and company represent that there is no other agreement, oral or written, existing between them. Okay? So, you know, obviously if this is an um, extension of the first agreement, and I think I have a slide about that, I'd like to show you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, if it's, you know, remember this is, this is supposed to represent the emails and phone calls before the first agreement. Okay, those disappear. To our detriment, because there was an agreement that we can't enforce, but it's gone. It's just the 2014 contract. Now they start saying, look, we're going to continue. We want to expand. They, they, they hire a guy specifically to come in who says, we want to expand our relationship with you. We want to do an extension. We want to expand it. And let's, let's do this, this, and other thing. And even he says, recently, according to the testimony of David Gold, that they were talking recently, and even he says, of course, it was an ex extension. Um, but anyway, they do it again, all these email stuff, and then you end up with the 2016 renewal. If indeed it's renewal, as they say everywhere, now it's a renewal and these things are read together. So it's still part of the agreement when they say um, they... D3M and company represent that no other agreement or already exists between them. But here's the other reason why we know it cannot possibly mean what the defense says in this case, that it eliminated both of the 250,000 and the 500,000 shares. There are other agreements. Remember when they were cross-examining somebody and they said, oh, wait, what about Johnny Nunez? This says no other agreements between D3M and company, because this is an agreement technically. D3M is the licensing agent. So it's D3M and Celsius are the parties to the contract. And they say there's no other agreement between D3M and Celsius. But there is. D3M also represents Johnny Nunez. And there's a Johnny Nunez contract. They, they used it to cross-examine somebody. And then he said, oh, by the way, and well, here's what an extension looks like. This was a simple extension, not an expansion. But the dates show it existed when this was signed. Could someone come in and say, oh, you don't have to pay Johnny Nunez because of this? It's just not true. It was language that a lawyer threw in, and it wasn't intended. If you read it carefully, it doesn't eliminate the, the first contract anyway. But... Um, it's just not true that there were no other agreements. And it could not possibly eliminate Johnny Nunez's contract. There's the stock transfer agreements, which I'm going to have to get into on the data breach. They can't transfer, you can't just issue stock. There has to be a agreement when, in this case, where it's issued directly from a company, there has to be a contract. There's stock transfer agreements that exist between them, in writing, in evidence. So it, that's just fundamentally false. And then last, I don't have the actual agreement, but they cross-examined David Gold about this, and they said, oh, remember, you got paid money. I, I remember they also said they paid $30,000 for Florida to take his entire production out to the NAX conference to help them land 7-Eleven, and oh, you got paid for that. Well, obviously that was expenses and things like that. Well, apparently there were involved in this Russell Simmons deal, too. Sometimes they say they had nothing to do with Russell Simmons, but then on the, the investment that saved the company, that was going out of business. And other times they say, oh, well, you got paid, reimbursement for expenses or, or payments or whatever it was for that. And that agreement existed. So it's just fundamentally false uh, if you interpret this to mean that there's no other agreements. So... And, and that can't eliminate agreements uh, that exist. And all of those are between D3F and Celsius. All right, so what is the union? Each time I go to a new question, I check the time. Forgive me. Okay, what is a union? Very important question because 690,000 units have to be sold in order for the 500,000 shares of stock to be used. Um, 
I, I already talked to you about the single use strategy. The decision to buy, the decision to try. It's critical to building this company. You don't get a loyal customer until they've already tried the drink and like it. Um, and, 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 you know, this, if you go work out at a commercial gym, you are going to hear my house. You are going to hear five songs in, a, in an hour. Well, maybe not that much. But you're, you're going to hear throughout the day, every hour a song. That, that for some reason, I don't know if it was intentional, but that is workout music. Okay, And so it makes sense with this deal for him and for the sales at the, at the gym. Um, and um, a lot of them don't have refrigeration. Especially, you, there's not going to be a refrigerated thing of ready to drinks. So this is not only cheaper than the drinks and a good way to get people to try for the first time, it's great for the gyms where people are already hearing his music. So the single-use strategy, Flow Fusion was a really critical part of the single-use strategy. Um, so, 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 let me just back up for a second. Before we get to that, I want to show you Jerry David because I have a question of is it plausible that this is not a union? And so I want to look at some of the things he said um, and then what the evidence shows on it. Before we get to this, the question, is it plausible that this is in a unit? And remember, you've heard um, that, you know, a, we know what a stock keeping unit is. I have to have a stack of books, but it's a, an SKU means stock keeping unit. So at, at the retail level, and when we're talking about customers, because remember, now we're in the customer calls. We're not talking about revenue anymore. We're talking about 690,000 retail sales. Customers. If you think of this in terms of dollars, you will never understand what the party's intended. It's customer. Even reading it, it's clear. But with all the other evidence, it can't mean anything else. So when you're talking about retail sales, the stock keeping unit is for the store to keep track. Oh, we need to buy more. Well, first of all, the UPC says what it costs uh, at, the re at the cash register, but also it inter interacts with the, with the inventory management system and says we sold them. And so at some point, they need to know how many. And this flavor has a different one. Um, if, if we look at it under the microscope, uh, it has a different stock keeping unit than the berry flavor um, because orange is different than berry because they don't want to sell all the berry and end up with only orange and not know. So they have different SPU stock keeping units. So you learned from John Fieldley that number one, it doesn't have a stock keeping unit. Then when I showed him the SKU, he said, well that's a lot number. I'm going to show you the lot number, because they do need lot numbers, right? These have expiration dates. The lot number changes every, with every lot. So that they, and, and the expiration is right next to the lot number. Uh, the SKU doesn't change. Um, oh yeah, and then they said it's a chromatic SKU. Okay, so I I hope that was clear what we were talking about. Uh, he he was saying that this this is not a SKU for the retail store selling one of these to the customer. This is a SKU for when our labeling company sends us the labels, the packets, to fill with cup. They buy them at five to 10,000 at a time, right? And they don't just buy one. They're, they're packed that way, but they buy 50 or whatever, 5,000 units. So if they buy 50 of these 5,000 units, because it, it then um, they, they, they're charged 50 times for this giant, uh, um, mound of I, I, it's a sheet actually of, of pack uh, I, I'm not sure what you would call this when, before it's filled but anyway they pay for that all at once there's one price for all 5,000 the idea that the, each one is a unit between chromatic who makes the packets and celsius is not remotely plausible they're not saying one tenth of a cent, here's another packet, right? They're not scanning and charging each of the 5,000. They just do it once. It, it, it's just not possible that this is a chromatic. So 
if you if the story changes from there is no skew to well, okay, I see that number there. There, there is no number on there. Oh, well, now I see that number, but that's not a skew. Uh, and okay, maybe it's a skew, but it's not our skew. It's not meant for the sale of this at retail. We have to look at not just the data, but the testimony. Okay, is it all plausible? And that's why I bring up um, some of these things. Jerry Gibson says, but I would never sign an auto review. And I didn't know it, but Christina just handed me a document. And said, oh, well, he, at the same time of this deal, he did one with someone named Emerson Fittipaldi with an auto review. There were only 10 people looking at full ride books. I think he actually said eight. Um, but then in the internal documents, they said they, he, Flowrider himself, official Flowrider posted 18 times in the first six months of the contract with a reach of 27 million on Facebook alone, plus, plus, plus for Instagram, plus, plus, plus for Twitter. So it wasn't eight people. Um, Flo had nothing to do with Chloe Kardashian. I showed you that the, the board member, who happens to be on Shark Tank, uh, Kevin Harrington testifying to the, uh, not testifying, but in the interview says the exact opposite. He had nothing to do with 7-Eleven. Okay, let me ask you this. Why is one of the greatest musical artists of all time paying for district, for ex exhibition space at a retail conference for beverage companies? It was to, because he's getting a million in stock and he's trying to help them. And he calls that little kid up on stage and that night they close a thousand stores. 7 Eleven has 7,000, 2,000 uh, are owned by the company, the rest are franchised. But that night, the same night they get a commitment to put it in a thousand stores. Okay? So. Oh, it's just not true. He had nothing to do with it. And the, the deal, the endorsement deal, he said, oh, that's not worth seven figures. He wrote it in an email that I showed you to the board. That's what he gets, typically, seven million. I'm not seven million. Seven figures. Which, which is a, it's a loose term. I mean, is it nine million? Is it 1.5 million? But we know that it's at least over a million dollars. Oh, and you know, they, they kind of, when they say stock, it, it started to happen to me too. That I'm thinking, oh, like 500 stock, $500,000. No, 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 no. Okay, you heard the testimony from this Billy. When he was truck hired, his first job was to get this back on the stock market because the owners couldn't even sell their stuff. In other words, it's, it's almost worthless because you can't sell it on a stock market. It's it's um, it's it's in, illiquid, so it's not like a regular stock. And it was worth way way less than a dollar. There was testimony, I think, that at points it was worth a quarter. But it's almost a fake number because it's that was the last sale. But you got to go find a buyer. You can't just put it on a stock market. So the idea that you know 500 shares was worth it's it's theoretically worth like less. Well under a couple hundred thousand dollars. But that's theoretical too, because it can't be sold. He had to believe that this was going to get on the NASDAQ and get there, and that he could help them do it for this deal to make sense. But when they say a million shares, don't get confused that that's a million dollars. Not even close. Um, all right. Again, is it plausible that this is not a unit? Uh, you were at, uh, Mr. Fairley, I said, you were asked on direct examination, did you sell sticks? Did you run promotions on sticks? Right, because if they ran promotions on sticks, it proves they're selling it at the cash register. No, no, no. No, 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 he said, three times on the direct. No, 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 never did that. You're, and so I asked him, you said, no, 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 do you remember that? Yes. Okay, and then he had to admit, vitamin shop, one of their largest retailers, this is their document, sending it to vitamin shop, saying, Run, this is minus 10, and I don't know if my reading glasses is what. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. I think it was 20 cents off a stick, and there's 20, 29 off, uh, 20 cents off single sticks. They, this, this is just one example, okay? They're running, they are telling the retailers to take, uh, in April or certain months, nationwide to run promotions on sticks. That means they're selling sticks at retail, what 
Could this be, how could it be less than a unit if it's being sold individually at retail? It's just not possible. And that's why they're saying they didn't run promotions, but they did. What do they call it in their documents? They had, they had a summer powder plant. I think this was 2015. Okay, what is the price of the stick? What is the cost of retailers? 60 cents per unit. Okay, the word in the contract. A stick in their own documents is a unit. What does Celsius cost to make that unit? 30 cents. And their gross margin is 30 cents. Per unit. 30 cents per unit, their own documents. Um, and I just want to try to do this real quick. Um, with the, Can we look at the microscope? You'll have this back there. Um, I'm not sure, but I think you'll be able to you'll have a couch there. I think you'll, you'll be able to have a little bit of glass, but... Let me just show you the, the lot number. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Can we can we zoom out a little? How do I do that? But it's not. It's too tight. Yeah, I gotta zoom out a little on it. I just want to show you real quick the. the is that zoom? Okay, what's that? So the lighting's not perfect, but uh, here's the light coming from. Okay, so you'll see on there there's a date, and you'll have this back there. That's the lot number, right? So it tells the date when it expires. Uh, so the idea that what I'm about to show you next to the UPC is a lot number, not possible. Uh, and then... Um, oh, it's upside down. The problem is, you see if I can do it right. All right, so you see FFB 814, flow, fusion, bury 814, right next to the UPC, but it's scanned at retail. The store knows they just sold a few. Flow, fusion, bury, SKU, stock keeping unit, just like their own documents say, it's a unit. All right, now, how did they get this oddly specific number of 690,000? Um, there's testimony from Mr. Fieldley where he says, oh, I came up with that number because I said, oh, we want to make $10 million and 690000 will get us there. Well, the problem is their expert comes in and they, they use different data. Um, you may remember, I'll show you a rebuttal if I have to. 690000 doesn't get them $10 million. By the way, they never made $10 million in before. In, in the, their company's history. So now they're going to have one new product that's going to make 10 million, or I think they made 12 million. But so I see that. This is something that made them $10 million, and the math doesn't add up. But anyway, it doesn't matter, because I didn't realize it till the middle of trial. I saw it in the email. It's not 10 million in revenue. They say, it was uh, Jerry David says to David Gold, this will be easy for him to meet the 690 benchmark. It's 1% of his followers. He's got 23 million Facebook followers. This is in the email. 1% uh, is 230. If they just buy three sticks, I think he might say units. I don't want to I don't want to mislead you on that. So we'll look at the email for a second when we get to it. Uh, if, it if he wrote units, I'm pretty sure I would have blown that up bigger. So it probably said... I, Let's see exactly what he says. But he says, if they just purchase three times, you get 690000 Now, why is that so important? It's the whole point of the single-use strategy. It's the whole point of the flow-over. It's the, the, the whole point of what we're doing. I want 230,000 new customers. That's what this means. 230,000 new customers. And 
a box, a display box, which they call it, which has 14 sticks that can be bought by 14 different people, is not one customer. When it's bought at retail by the stick, it's 14 customers. And we're talking about 230,000 new customers. Why is that important? If they buy three times, okay, it's reasonable to assume they like the product. What's the flow over going to be? Right? If they, become, if they buy one can a week, it's about 75 bucks a year. From that one customer, year in and year out, they keep drinking Celsius, $17 million. That, that's why the single-use strategy is important. That's why there's a whole clause just on customers, getting new customers. This is not about revenue. They could lose money on this deal in the first year, but it will pay for itself massively year over year over year. That's why people advertise. Because companies pay money, but they get it back. That's why there's buy one, get one free. There's all sorts of reasons, but customer is worth it. And a loyal customer who bought three times. So that's the whole point. There, it's just not true that that number, 690,000, oddly specific number, came from John Gibley because it's a revenue number. This has nothing to do with revenue, and the documents prove here it is from uh, Jerry David to David Gold. When we sell uh, 690,000 units sold from all channels of distribution, not we sell, sold through the channels of distribution at retail by the customer. That's one percent of his followers ordered three times. He and it's in the board of directors too, right? He, he, the board of directors they discuss it. It's in the mint book. Uh, you might have to look at that. Plant Defendants one seventy seven is the board of directors meeting. I don't have it blown up, but the same language. It's um, two hundred and thirty thousand customers, which is one percent of. The Social media following, buying three times, and I think they might even use the 17 million number uh, from the flow over. All right, this is advertising, plans 256, they're advertising to retailers, to uh, the channels of distribution, and saying, um, here's what you, here's, here's what it is, they've got single packet. I'm gonna try to move a little quicker. All right, this is very important though. Um, Letter, a letter came from us demanding the data, and, and a few days before the response, which you have, the April 30th response, which is in evidence and I showed you, there's emails at the company saying, hey, how much did we sell? I guess to give it to the lawyers. Well, what did the company people say? Well, the Tubs, we sold um, 151000 A million nine. That's higher than six hundred and ninety thousand. Okay, that's what they're talking about units. All right, but even if you think the units a box or a case or what other thing, um, remember uh, there's no deadline on this, and there's no doubt that eventually, uh, even if you define it as a box, which they say um, we say it was February 2015, they say September 2019. Okay, but it was still met. It's and there's no deadline. Um, and that following the execution in this clause without a deadline is very different than during the term. I'm going to try to move a little more quickly. You'll have plaintiffs 286. It proves that February 2015, they sold more than 690,000 sticks. Plaintiffs 285 shows that uh, September 2019, it sold more than 690,000 boxes. Uh, their defense has no problem with the math. Last, what was the date of the breach? Um, all conditions precedent have to be met before there's a breach. I, I'll let you, the judge read it to you, you'll have the jury instructions, but they, they don't breach until all the conditions are met, right? And so one of, the, one of the conditions is that the stock will be issued as directed by D3M. Until D3M directs, they can't be in breach. That's a, you know, it's, if they got sued and said, you didn't issue the stock, and they would say, well, to who? Right? You have to be directed. Who, what percentage is, who gets it, and the contract is clear. That's, and there even has to be a stock transfer agreement entered into before the transfer of stock. So until if the direction happens, there can be no breach. When was the breach? Well, we talked about, this is with David Gold, what are all the, um, 
the missing data, you tried to get data, they wouldn't give me data, you demanded it in writing on February 26th, and then on April 30th, Subsea says, no, we're not issuing the shares. Um, Lee Prince said the exact same thing, they had to send to the right address, the notice, everything. Um, it had to be directed by E3. So the breach was not, was April 30th, 2021. You're going to be asked that question, April 30th, 2021. Um, and the, um, the notice, I, I don't need to go through all this, but um, everything was complied with. Um, and then on April 30th, they said, we're not giving you the stock. It is restricted stock. You need to know that uh, when you're trying to determine, because the judge instructed you that the amount of compensatory damages has to equal, put the plaintiff in the position sell for six months. All right, let's go through the very form. Greater the weight of the evidence. Um, remember, in a criminal case, um, it starts like this, and the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. If there's anything close here, I'm just, I don't think there is, but I have to tell you, this is the standard. And you may talk about this in deliberate. It starts out even, and if the greater weight is even slightly in one direction or the other, um, we have to prove it by the greater weight of the evidence, not by beyond a reasonable doubt. Which I think I'm going to have to take a little bit of my rebuttal time, but... Uh, right. You're almost at your five-minute warning, but if you want more time, that's fine. Yeah, I know. It just comes out of your back end. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, all right, so uh, first question, was there a breach? Now, these questions are important, okay? And um, it's complicated, very important. They're no, no one's fault. It just had to be. But the first question, was there a breach of the agreement? Um, in other words, was the million dollars... Uh, Reverend Goldman. On what date? Okay? And this is going to be easy. It's June... No, sorry. <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, April 30th, 2021. Um, and I proved to you why. Um, was it extended? Okay, now, whether the question is yes or no, we still met that benchmark, but it was extended. And so the answer to that should be yes. And now, they say, the defendants have to prove this is their burden, not ours. But they say, look, even if we owed all this, you waived it. Because, I'm not sure why, actually. You don't get it, even if we owe it. We'll hear in a minute how we waived it. Uh, then they say, well, you waited too long to sue. So that's what this question is. Five years before we actually um, sued. So the breach occurred before then. And the benchmarks were met before then, right? But it's just uh, true that the breach didn't actually occur until the stock was directed to be issued. Uh, so uh, the answer to that is no, because the date of the breach was April 30th, 2021. Um, but that's why it's on there. It's a weird date. What's that date, you might think? It's five years from before the suit was filed, and they're saying you waited too long to sue. Uh, we... We have a defense to that, right? They say you waited too long to sue. We say no, the breach occurred after anyway. But even if that were true, you concealed the information. And that's not allowed under the law. So that's why, um, yeah, I don't think you're going to answer question six and seven because there's an instruction that says if the date of the breach is after um, the statute of limitations date, you don't even answer these. But if you are answering from some reason, they did conceal the information. You can't, if they're saying, we met the benchmarks, but you waited too long to sue, they concealed the information. Um, and it's the same thing that they should be, it's a weird legal term, equitably stopped. It's defined in the jury instructions, but it's just not right. It's not fair for them to not give us the data and then say, oh, you should have sued earlier. Um, uh, that actually is not on the verdict for in questioning now. Right. Uh, there we go. Um, all right. Now, then you ask the question of damages. Um, you have to put us in the position that we would have been in um, if there had been no breach. So, I'm giving you the stock price on several dates, so that and you, you by the way, will have a print a printout of the stock price on every date until Friday, uh, so you can look anywhere. But um, when you're determining the amount. 
you have to multiply 250,000 by. And I have to say one thing. We wanted the stock. They demanded the stock. They demanded it legally, just issued the stock. The stock was refused to be issued. In a lawsuit like this, in this courtroom, it is beyond the power of the court or you to order a company to issue stock. But the, but the law said that's okay because the jury and the court can figure out the monetary amount. But then they come in here and say, oh, you're greedy. You want money, you don't want stock. After they demanded the stock multiple times. Okay, So you have to put a monetary number on this. After that, they can choose to issue the stock. They can still issue the stock. That's what we want. But for now, we have no choice. It's not us wanting to be in this position. They want the stock. But the only thing the law allows, and it's not right to criticize, <coughs> for doing, they won't give us the stock for doing the only thing the law allows. All right. April 30th, which is the date they breached, the stock was $57.30. If you multiply that by $250,000, it's $14,325,000. Now, but they couldn't sell it. If you think the date of breach should be the date that you value the stock. Um, but they couldn't sell the stock for six months. So the very first day they could sell the stock, on November 1st, it was $101. And if you decide that's the appropriate date, uh, in case you think they would have sold the stock on that date, I guess. Um, and that would be $25,350,000. Um, if um, you believe they would have held the stock, which is what they said, they don't want money, they want stock, just to get the stock. Um, on the last day of evidence, it was $110. So that would be $27,545,000. 1% of the company, that's what he was supposed to get. Everything that they, their vision intended happened. It was a big risk for him. It was a big risk to do this. He, had, he was exclusive. He had to give up deals with, with uh, mature companies worth a lot more money. He took the risk hoping that this would happen. This little company, that this would happen. 12 employees. And it did. And now he's not getting his 1%. And they won't give them the stock, which is all he wants. Um, anyway, so that, that's, we have to do those numbers. All right, now I'll go through quickly because that was all about the 250. There's the same questions about the 500,000. Did they breach it? In other words, were the 690,000 units sold? Um, on what date? Same date, June 30, April. <laughs> this is important. Okay, that date is important. It has to be consistent with the evidence. April 30, 2021. Um, and then we just have the question. But either way, the question to 11 is yes. Uh, the, uh, the, these numbers are a little bit off because we one question is struck. But the question to whether they... Uh, did, they did we prove 690,000 units? Yes, no matter how you define unit. However... A unit is a stick. A unit is a stick. That's very important, and, and that question should be answered. Yes, a unit is a stick. Uh, did we waive? Same questions. I'm not going to go through these again. I'm just going to go. So this is 500,000 shares, so it's just double of whichever one, whichever price um, you decide to use. Um, Royalties. Okay, I'm going to go through real quick. That's because the, the, there's only I. I'm not even going to get to the exact numbers. It's more than this, but I'm going to say hundred thousand dollars. This is just a matter of principle. Just like for these two, one has a during the charm and the other one doesn't. In the music industry, somebody could be just in the room when the song is written, and then they get royalties forever. Okay, so that's how they came to this contract. In in other businesses, it's different. But they said, E3 on the floor, right? We, no term, no limit on that royalty provision, the one on the screen. And so it's not in there. There is no limitation on the term. So it's not a, a, a huge amount of money, but it's just a matter of principle. It, there's no limitation on, on, and this has nothing to do with the powered sticks, because we accept it. Okay, you stop selling flow fusion powered sticks, don't include that. But you're supposed, on sparkling orange, ready to drink, which is still being sold in the exact same way, it's supposed to get the royalty. It's a matter of principle to him, $100,000. Um, and then again, you have to say that they wait. Uh, uh, 
I will go through this real quick. I think I'll, I'll, I'll have this. Uh, Your Honor, I think I'll only have 10 minutes for rebuttal, but I want to finish. It's up to you. Thank I'll you, Your Honor. Now when we're done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Celsius at 12 employees before 2014. Uh, they were in debt by over $47 million. In 2014, their documents say there's substantial doubt about the company even staying in business. Something that happened, a yacht event for Russell Simmons, the godfather of hip-hop. No coincidence that the godfather of hip-hop and Flo Rida, the, the biggest crossover hip-hop star, the popular music ever in the history of the world, knows Russell Simmons, and they come together and he says, let me tell you about the Celsius thing, and then they announce on April 20th that it, they, everything's done, and they get the money, and then I'll show you the exact language. Here it is. First, substantial doubt. Then they say, hey, we got a leak. There was testimony about this. Lee Cushing and Russell Simmons and Kamorley Simmons, they put in the money and they have the distribution. And now um, it alleviates the doubt regarding the company. It saved the company. There is no company without this man. Uh, Emerson Fittipaldi, you heard about him. He had a five-year term, not a two-year. He got an auto renew that they don't do, and he got paid in full. It's not right to treat him different. So, um, let me say again, thank you for coming to record us today. I'm almost done. I mean, three to four minutes. There are more important... I woke up in the middle of my I'm to write this down, so if this is the time I'm going to be looking at my notes a little bit more. There are more important things in life than money. You can just look around, you know, what's happening in the world, and you know that. But this is important. Whenever, uh, there's, an, I guess this is kind of the bar. In the old courthouse, it was more, that I came up in, it was more prominent. But whenever I pass the bar, come into the well to give a closing argument, I'm kind of in awe of this system. My, um, my grandfather used to say to me, uh, you're lucky to be born in America, but you're also unlucky because you don't appreciate some things about what happens here. Um, and I think about that when I come in here. My, 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 grand, my dad was born in Estonia, came to this country right after World War II. I try to think about that. I try to appreciate what we have in the system of justice because it is very rare in human history for disputes to be resolved this way. Where one human being, not just Flo Rida, because I'm not him, most people are him, but not just him. Any human being stands equal in this courtroom to a $10 billion corporation. And that is not normal in human history. It's special. We even have, these disputes are decided by people, regular, real people like you, not government bureaucrats. And um, we even have, the power is so, the people is so fundamental that we, it's like fish swimming through water. You know, they don't even know there's such a thing as water. We even, I served on a grand jury, you know, about these things, grand jury. The government can't even indict someone and put them on trial, not put them in prison, put them in trial, unless regular people approve and say, yes, there's enough evidence to indict that person. Which is not what it was like in Estonia, where my grandfather was born after World War II when he was arrested. And that's why it was so awe-inspiring to him that you can't that something like that can't happen to So why do I bring that up? Every time I come in here for a closing argument, I try to remind myself, wow, I'm lucky to be here. And I know from jury selection that not every juror comes here and thinks that. But we all are, you are too, lucky to be here. And um, just ask you, um, not anything related to this case to remember, but we have a special 
and then to do your part here, what you're asked to do, which is follow the law and use common sense. Thank you. Closing arguments on behalf of the defense. Um, everyone okay? All right, we'll keep. Uh, yeah, they're going to take all that out of the way. And I will switch over for. on behalf of the defense. So, it's been more than seven days and I finally get to speak to you all again. It's a pleasure. Um, and it took seven days for me to realize that I actually agree on something with Mr. Gustav. What, what he said, he just finished saying. Because I understand exactly how he feels. Because I think every lawyer that walks in through that little gate right there feels the same way. This is an incredible system. Just like Mr. Ustal said, my father was a, uh, an emigre of totalitarianism. He was a Cuban refugee, fought in the Bay of Pigs, um, was a wanted man in Cuba by Castro's regime. None of this exists in Castro's regime. This is awesome power. Totalitarian states fear this. They don't fear presidents, they don't fear Congress, they don't fear anything, but they fear this, they fear the people. You are the people who are going to be deciding in this case. You have sacrificed a lot, you have suffered the cold, you suffered the chairs, it's been difficult, I know it's been seven days, it's long, you've been hearing us talk for hours and hours and hours, and I know all you want to do is, thank you very much, I want to go back to the deliberation room and I want to decide this case. So I'm going to do my best to move this along. Um, be fair and impartial, give everybody a fair shake. That's all I can do. One bit of little humor. So we left on Friday, and Rebecca Placencio drove back to Miami to go be with her kids that she hadn't seen in a week. And what was waiting for her? The jury summons. <laughs> so poor Rebecca has to show up to Miami Dade County for a jury selection on January 5th. I bet you she's going to be selected. And I bet you she's going to do a great job because she has been observing you the entire week. So I'm going to give this back to her. If not, she's going to get in trouble. <laughs> All right. So the judge instructed you on the law before we got up to speak with you. And he talked about the, the standard greater weight of the evidence. And he said, you know, it's greater weight of the evidence means the more persuasive and convincing force and effect of the entire evidence in the case. All right. That's, that's interesting. That's the law. We're not all lawyers here, so let's apply this in, in real life. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a suggestion here. You can accept it or you can disregard it. But I want to give a little story. Um, and I think this will help you view the testimony and the evidence and the arguments presented by both sides and hopefully simplify things for you. So, back when I was in college up north, early 80s, we'll just leave it at that in the early 80s, um, I, I needed to fulfill a course requirement. And of course, I procrastinated in the college student and I didn't pay attention. And before you knew it, all the classes had been taken up. And so I was left with, and it was a philosophy class of all things. And I was left with one option, Mondays and Fridays, 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, brutal for a college kid. No Starbucks at the time. So you show up, it's cold, the last thing you want to hear is some professor drooling on about philosophy. 
Um, and I do remember, I don't know why I remember, but I did remember this one class where this professor, he was talking about some English friar named William of Ockham, who lived in the 14th century. And old Will, he was a, um, he was a friar, he was a monk, and, you know, he had a lot of time on his hands to think about important things like, why are we here, and why do, we, why do things work this way, I don't understand this. And he was into problem solving, and he was big on economy, or whatever that means. He, his, one of his quotes is, it is futile to do with more things that which can be done with fewer. That went over my head when I was taking the class. But then the professor went on a little bit, and, I, and he said, you know, over the years, they took this thought of the you know, Friar William, and basically distilled it down to this. And basically is, the simplest explanation is likely to be the most, the, the correct one. Right? And that, this is a problem-solving principle, okay? And it's called Occam's Razor. And, and, and the reason I remember all this is because I thought it was the coolest thing that a professor said, hey, this old prior back in the 14th century came up with something called Occam's razor. And I'm like, okay, why is it called a razor? Why do they refer to a razor? Because it is a way to shave off unnecessary assumptions to get you to the right answer. So in thinking of this case, I thought, I came to the conclusion, I thought, well, you know, which of the answers is simplest here? The ones that Celsius is promoting or the ones that the plaintiffs are promoting? Which is the simplest? Use Occam's razor. Because typically, if it's the simplest explanation, it's likely going to be the correct. So, ask yourself the following questions. Whose argument makes you jump through the most hoops? Whose argument makes you go in so many different directions to get to the point that they want? Which argument takes you in the most direct line to an answer that is likely correct? Just picture. So, it's a block. You've heard, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much. What does it do? First question in this case, what does it do? Are Tops? Sticks? It's a box. Now, it's undisputed that a unit is this. The parties agreed. When the contract was signed, the 2014 contract was signed, this was considered a unit. Now, what is the simplest answer? Is this a unit? Or is this a unit? Compare. What gets you to the right answer? When you go back there, take a look at these items. Look at all of the evidence, and you'll see. I think you'll get to the correct answer. Other question. What is co-branded revenue? Is it only the revenue generated by the co-branded products? With the two brands and the logo, you heard Mr. Fieldley and you heard Mr. David talk about that. It's the very essence of the 2014 agreement. When you look at the 2014 agreement, it's all about co-branded product. We want to create a powder. By the way, tell me. You want to co-brand it. You want to put Celsius name on it. You want to put Flowrider's logo on it. It's the very essence of the document. And I think the judge said something, and I think Mr. Usel said something, and I agree. You gotta look at the entire agreement, the totality of the agreement, to come to your answers. I know we've been giving you little bits and pieces and things like that, and that's not fair. When you go back to the jury room, you're gonna have the entire agreement. And you could and I urge you to flip through it, to look through it, and you'll see how it all kind of fits together. Next question. How long was the 2014 agreement in effect? In other words, how long was that agreement, what was the term of that agreement, so that you could then measure the benchmarks? Was the term somehow extended, even though the document that supposedly did that, the 2016 agreement, remember, they're only relying on one document, the 2016 agreement to extend the 2014 agreement, right? Doesn't look at the 2016 agreement. Nowhere in the 2016 agreement are you going to see the words, this document extends the 2014 agreement. This document extends the benchmarks. That language is nowhere to be found. 
And when you look at the emails leading up to the 2016 agreement, there is no mention anywhere about extending the 2014 agreement and the benchmarks in the 2014 agreement. And when you look at the memorandum of understanding, because remember, D3M love to memorialize everything. They love to put everything in writing. Mr. Gold was, he was the one who was experienced in branding. He was the one who was experienced in endorsements. And he was very careful when he wrote and he drafted those documents. He wanted to make sure that they captured everything that they agreed. And yet, of the most important thing, whether the benchmarks from 2014 were extended, they're absent. And in fact, what you have instead of that is you have a provision in the 2016 agreement that says specifically, you can put that up the 2016 agreement, 13.10. You have those last two sentences that Ms. Placencia told you about in her opening statement. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Occam's razor. The simplest answer is likely the correct one. That's all you have to look at. Um, and I'm not even sure I'm going to spend a little, much more time on this, but there's the there's you know there, there's a claim that the royalties that they have a claim under the royalties under the 2016 agreement, and they asked for hundred thousand dollars. That's it's almost like a throwaway. I mean, the reality is, is that the royalties, that the numbers weren't there for the royalties to be met, they know it. And, and the problem is that there's no claim there. I'll get back to that later as we, as I finish with my presentation. So, nobody complained until 2021. That's no coincidence. We know that only when the money got tight during the pandemic, when Celsius stock price went through the roof, that's when all of these arguments came to life. But you can't change the rules of the game after the fact. The math is the math. The sales just didn't meet expectations. The number of, they just didn't get to the 690,000 units within the term of the 2014 agreement. And they didn't get to the million dollar threshold of the sale of the co-branded products in 2014. It's just it's as simple as that. It's really it's not that complicated. No. When you first came into court a week ago, the judge told you what this case was about, and you must have wondered, why in the world are we here? This is a, we're in 2023, and we're talking about a contract that was signed in March of 2014. Um, in her opening statement, Rebecca told you about, she gave you the answer, she told you that based on what the evidence will show, that the reason we're here is greed. It's the only reason. And, and it's why you're here nine years later. The reality is, is that Mr. Dillard and these women were paid handsomely and extremely well under the 2014 agreement. Okay? Remember when Ms. Placencia talked about the difference between endorsement and licensing? The endorsement part of it. Mr. Dillard was paid very well. We know that in 2014, he got $300,000 in cash. And he also received 250,000 shares of stock. By the way, under the numbers that you just saw, they are worth approximately $25 million. If they held on to their stock, they'd be sitting on $25 million. How about 2016? 2016 deal, even better. 500000 and another 250000 shares. Another 25 million if they hold on to the shares. 50 million dollars. Plus 500 here and 300 here, another 800,000. And remember, this is all about endorsement. And what's that? Endorsement is everything that you've heard them say about him 
showing a can in a video, or showing a, or posting a picture with a can on it, or with a box on it, or all the advertising that Celsius ran, which included, you know, his likeness and stuff with not only the tubs and the boxes, but also the cans. All right, we paid for that. Celsius paid for that. Going to the convention in Vegas, part of this. Now there were other things that they paid for out of pockets and things, but basically we paid for all of this. And Mr. Yusuf makes a good point. Of course, Mr. Dillard was more than happy to do these things because he was an owner and he wanted a company to do well. Any owner would want to do that. So, one of the ways a publicly traded company um, one of the ways you measure the success of a publicly traded company is its stock price. And let's go up and show the first one. So we know <coughs> that under the 2014 agreement and the term of the 2014 agreement, which is, you say, March of 2014 through March of 2016, the Celsius stock price was very low, 60 cents a share when we started. And when that term ended, it was a dollar ninety-five share. Some improvement, but not significant. Whether you measure success of the endorsement deal and whether they were successful and that resulted in a, an increase in the stock price, that's for you to judge. But it seems like it didn't move that much. Let's go to the next one. In 2016, from 2016 agreement, excuse me, from April 2016 until October 20, uh, 2018, but remember that was the 30 month term. Stocks didn't do much either. 220 a share to 350 a share. Again, four years of flow rider, endorsements, promotions, and things, and yes, the stock went up, but not significant. Is it a success? Marginal or less? Nothing wrong with that. Parties go their separate ways. 2018 agreement is over. The 2016 agreement is over after 30 months. Parties go their separate ways. Mr. Dillard is out promoting other products. We can't sell Flow Fusion anymore. That's understandable. No problems with that. Let's go to the next one. And even a year after the deal is over, the stock actually fell a little bit after a year to 323 a share. So there's not even any carryover from what Mr. Dillard did on behalf of the company. I'm not saying, and again, this case is not about whether Mr. Dillard did the things that he was supposed to do or didn't and, and didn't get paid for it. We know that that's not the issue in this case. He did get paid for it and he did the things that he did. It just didn't end up in a result that everybody was looking for, including Mr. Dillard. So now, Let's go to the last. So this, this tells the story. Because what this tells you and what this shows you is that the success that Celsius has experienced, particularly in the last couple of years, really had nothing to do with a 2014 endorsement agreement and a 2016 endorsement agreement. Um, and by the way, after the 2014 agreement w was ended and a new agreement, the 2016 agreement was signed, there was no uh, letter, email, anything from the D3M strong arm people saying, hey, what about the benchmarks? When are you going to give us the shares? Everybody knew that the products had not done well and that they had not met the benchmarks. So none of that happened. And Candidly, probably, when you look at the, the, the evolution of the stock price in those four years, they had no incentive to ask for it. So what happens after 2019, or at least starting after the 2016 agreement, the term of that 2016 agreement ends? You, and you heard Mr. Furley testify about this. All of the things that Celsius started to do in order to improve the company. 
and to make it the success that it is today. And he talked about the expansion of the distribution units with Anheuser-Busch. He talked about the opening up of distribution channels because Bang decided to go exclusive with Pepsi. All of these things happened after October of 2018. And, and as you see, the stock price started going in 2020. Not even in the beginning, it was still a little bit low, but then it started to really go up. Right? And what happens? We hear from Mr. Dillard that the pandemic is causing him problems. He, he's got to make ends meet because he's not touring, he's not doing shows, and that's understandable. No one could be together, and you couldn't go to a concert, and you couldn't go to a club. Pandemic sh shut us down. So he started selling his Celsius stuff in order to make ends meet. Again, nothing wrong with that. But that's not Celsius's problem. That's not, Celsius is not responsible or liable because he made a business decision and his advisors made a business decision to sell the stock so that he can make ends meet. And when is it? And when is it that we find out that there is now all of a sudden a claim being asserted by Mr. Dill and BT? February of 2021, when the stock price has now started to peak. No point. There's no claim before. And there never has been any claim. But now because the stock price has gone up, and now because there's this coulda, woulda, shoulda, shouldn't have sold that stock. I'd be holding on to $50 million. I had to sell it. And when I sold it, yes, it was at a certain level, but it wasn't at the level that they're claiming now. So we already talked about what this case is not about, which is this is not about whether he owed anything for it, or Mr. Dillard owed anything for endorsement, or, or whether he did the endorsement. What is this case about? The case is about the plain words in the contract and its meaning. And you know, parties spend a long time trying to put together a document that reflects their understanding of the deal. And when you go back to the jury room and you look at that contract, just ask yourself, which side has the more strained interpretation of the words that are in that document? Just ask yourself, which one is the simplest answer? All right, I, I did want to say, I did want to mention one thing that I thought was interesting. Uh, they've mentioned a lot about Celsius being a small company the time that the agreement was entered into in 2014. And it's true. They had, I think Mr. David testified at some point, they went down to 12 employees. I think at the time that this doc, the, the 2014 agreement was signed, I think Mr. Diller had more people in his band than Celsius had employees. I mean, this document, this was Celsius's first attempt to co-brand. They had never done this before. And so it was D3M who came and kind of dictated what the parameters of the contract would be. Yes, there were emails going back and forth, but you look at the emails, and it's Dave Gold who was really kind of running the show. It's his, he drafted the document. It's his lawyer that drafted the document. It's his document with the D3M on the left ahead in the document. So, again, if they had wanted things to say things, then they should have written it in there. They didn't. Um, you'll see the emails. You'll see the lead up. It's clear, at least with regard to, for example, co-branded revenue. It's clear that Jerry David and everybody, and even the board of directors of Celsius is referring to the revenue that's generated from the sale of co-branded. Products. This is the only co-branded product that Celsius have. Nothing else. The cans of Celsius do not have Flow Riders logo. They're not co-branded products. Do not mistake endorsement of a product with co-branding. 
they're not equal. Completely different. Endorsement, licensing. E3M licensed the use of Flowrider's logo so we could put it on this box and make it a co-branded part. The million dollar revenue threshold was based on the sale of these two products within that two year term of the 2014 agreement and had to be for 12 consecutive months. Their numbers don't show that ever happened. Even big million dollars. Now, yes, they say, oh, if you include this, you count this instead. That's not the case. And Mr. Gold testified, I think his testimony was he acknowledged that at the time the 2014 contract was signed, the co-branded revenue goal was initially tied to the co-branded product, but then it evolved. Evolved. It's not one email saying, hey, we're evolving. We're, we're going to now incorporate other Celsius products in this revenue venture. It's, it's just, it doesn't exist. That's made up. Right. And think of co-branding, just to, just to put a, a fine point on it, think of co-branding as like a credit card where you'll have an Amazon credit card, branded credit card with Visa. Or Michael Jordan and Nike shoes. Perfect example. There's co-branding. The only co-branding again, box tops. Um, They also make it clear, um, and I just want to make sure I want to go back to the units. Just keep this in mind. They did not meet, according to their own number, they did not meet the 690,000 unit threshold until September 2019. It's five years after the contract was signed. And three, more than three years after the end of the first contract. So they're, they're out of time. No. And on the revenue threshold, they also say that they didn't meet it until February 2018. That's also beyond the time frame of the first contract. The first contract ended in, in March of 2016. So they're out of time. So they need you, obviously, to uh, agree that the term of the contract is the term of the 2014 contract. And we talked a little bit about how you go about extending the term of a contract, and I showed you defendants 11 and 12, and I believe Mr. Eustos showed it to you, which is the John Nunez agreement. And this was a document that obviously B3M and Celsius were a part of, but that was a separate and completely distinct agreement. Let's be clear, this has nothing to do with the flow, with the, with the endorsement agreement, with this particular agreement. This is a completely different agreement, but I use it and I bring it up only as an example of how you go about doing things, because Mr. Gold knew how to extend the contract. And this is how he did this particular contract, which was for a one year term, actually it, it, with a term that expired on July 31, 2015, and then if you go to the next document, he actually did an addendum after the fact, extending it by one year. Simple answer is likely the correct one. Okay. We also, again, I'm not going to belabor the point, 1310, section 1310, in the 2016 agreement, says very clearly, this is the only agreement, there's nothing else. Now, you heard an opening, oh, wait a minute, there is something else, there's the Mr. Nunez agreement. Here's an example. Wrong. The reason it's wrong is because if you look at this document, 1310 says, with regard to the subject matter herein. So what you're talking about, when you use that language, you're talking about only the stuff that's in that agreement, in the 2016 agreement. It has nothing to do with Mr. Nunez. Only the agreement with P3M, Celsius, and Strong. So 
just want to make sure that that was clear in your mind when you go back to the jury room. talk a little bit about um, the ability to use the flow rider name and image, etc. And if you can pull up the 2014 endorsement agreement, Scott, 6C. And just so that we're clear, this is in the 2014 agreement, and you'll see it when you go back. But what, it, what this means is that Celsius had the right to use for Ryder's image, his intellectual property, his likeness, his name, everything, for any product. Okay. Again, endorsement fee paid for that. So when they talk about, when the plaintiffs talk about, you know, look at him in the video using the can, or look at this ad, or look at him going to the convention, and, you, and, and all of these things, all of that, Celsius had a right to, do, to use under this 2014 agreement. And then when the 2016 agreement was entered into, that continued. In 2018, that right stopped. And so they could no longer use his image, they could no longer use his name, they couldn't use his logo, that stopped. They had to stop selling for fusion, they had to stop everything. They still want what? Under the 2016 agreement. Remember, the 2016 agreement changed. The financial terms changed. It wasn't, it was no longer, there were no, these, no longer these benchmarks, and there was no longer, you had to sell 690,000 units, you had to meet a certain revenue benchmark. In 2016, it was just what it is. And they advanced pay $500,000 to Mr. Dillard for the work. And so the idea was if you can get enough sales to generate royalties beyond 500,000, then he gets more money. That never happened. But they're suing. And they want $100,000 just because they want $100,000. Well, they want royalties in perpetuity without loyalty in perpetuity. He went out in 2018 after his contract was over and he competed with another brand. Bang. That's not a dispute. So the entitlement for royalty ended in 2018. I'm going to talk a little bit, a little more about unit, just to make sure that we're clear on unit. And there were some things that came up in, in the closing that I, I think it's clarified. Let's go to Plaintiffs Exhibit 24. You'll see this in the jury room with all the other documents. And very lots of talk about lot numbers and skews on stakes and trying to show it here. And then we, look, the only thing that matters is how did Celsius record its products. And if you see this document, which is in evidence, you'll see that for the single packet sticks. There was no SKD. This is the Celsius item code. You had the UPC. Remember, we Mr. Fieldy said that. They had the UPC because they had to sell it. They wanted to give their retailers the opportunity to sell it. They're the ones that are selling it individually. But they didn't sell it individually. There's no SKU there. There's no number associated with the actual stick. It's only with the box. Right. Trust. Um, there's been talk about data, whether the data was accurate, whether the data was supplied, whether it was withheld, whether it was concealed. And there's no there's no evidence of, of, of concealment because there was no request for the data ever. There was no print out a report for me that shows that what you're telling me is true. And you heard testimony that Mr. Gold was basically embedded in Celsius, for lack of a better term. He was there at least three times a week. 
He would call Jerry David constantly, text him constantly, constantly trying to figure out what's going on, how are things, and the information was being provided. Now, was it provided in an email here is an Excel spreadsheet attached to this email that shows that this, based on our conversation that the sales are not meeting our objectives? No, no, no. Now, there's no email from Mr. Gold or Strongarm, and you know, they have lawyers too, saying, we want to see, we want to see the data. We want, to subs we want you to substantiate it. And the reason they didn't ask is because the data, they hadn't been met. And they knew it. Everybody knew it. The GF and GNC, for example, they, they pulled this. They said, we don't want it anymore. And then how many, how many years afterwards did it take for them to meet the 690,000 unit threshold? 2019. So they knew that it wasn't being met. It's not, this is not a question of concealment. The data is the data. The math is the math. It doesn't change anything. Remember, simplest answer is likely the correct. Didn't hear any testimony from that they were misled. How about this? I found it interesting that Mr. Dillard quoted Ronald Ray to trust and verify. I don't know if any of you remember why Ronald Ray, what, what he was responding to about that. He was responding to the negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union with regard to disarmament of nuclear weapons. And Ronald Reagan, being the war hawk that he allegedly was, said, you know what, I don't have a problem with that, but you've got to trust and verify. you got to make sure that if you're going to say they're going to reduce the noose, that you're going to verify. But here, in this particular instance, there was no need to verify because they knew all. You don't need to trust and verify when you already know. And they already know. Mr. Gold was a sales representative. He had access to this information. He knew how to read a financial statement. He could see where the company, what the company was doing, um, what were its revenues like. He even realized this. The 2016 agreement shifts the focus away from revenue generation and from unit sales and says, let's go to royalties. And by the way, let's not only go to royalties, let's kind of, you know, yes, we're going to still ask for royalties on the box. And note that in, in the 2016 agreement, it talks about the box. Take a, look at the, take a look at the royalties provision in the 2016 agreement. It doesn't talk about sticks. It talks about the box. But he also adds, and the company agrees to add, we'll give you royalties on the sale of the ready-to-drink king. Because this was not doing well. Not doing well. But the can work. And so, obviously, to incentivize and to provide some incentive for Mr. Hillary to continue endorsing the product, to give them royalties on the ready-to-drink. Unfortunately, they didn't. When you combined it, and you look at the, and you'll see the formula to determine what it, it didn't get to that threshold. All right. So, finishing up. Um, let's go back to Rebecca's opening remarks. I really like them because I thought they really simplified things. Simple answer is the best. And she said, don't be dazzled by the show. Don't be dazzled by the performance. I saw videos, I saw posts, all that. It doesn't All covered by this. Not an issue in the case. None of the videos, none of the posts tell you, they don't explain whether the 690,000 unit threshold was met. None of those videos and none of the posts tell you whether there were sales in a 12-month period that generated one million dollars in program revenue. The only thing that matters is the testimony that you heard today with regard to whether that in fact happened factually, and we know that it did. And the only way, the only way, plaintiffs get to those questions is if you agree that the 2014 agreement was extended. But we know it wasn't extended. It was a brand new agreement. The terms were completely different. This was 
This was a renewal of a relationship. This was the contract of the baseball player is over, and the baseball team is renewing the contract with the player under new terms. It's usually much bigger, more profitable terms, especially if the player had a good year. Um, Celsius has accomplished much since these contracts expired. Um, it has grown and learned. Its employees have worked very hard. Um, I think I heard nobody that attribution that Mr. Dillard saved his company. As Mr. Fielding said, he has 250 employees at the bank here. Takes a village. And that's what they've been doing in Sunset for the last two, two, two and a half years. Um, and respectfully, respectfully, Mr. Dillard had no real part in success because those contracts were over and everybody had moved on. And again, Mr. Dillard and he could have participated in that success, but they chose not to. They had their reasons. No one's criticizing them, but they have to, they have to own up to that. It's not Celsius' fault. They made the decision. A business deal is a business deal. You don't get a do-over just because you're unhappy with the results. Go back to what Fire Williams said. The simple answer is likely the correct one. Thank you. Much health and happiness to you. Do you want to remove the these lines? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I got it. <laughs> All right, rebuttal. I have 12 minutes. Thank you, Your rebuttal Honor. On behalf of the plaintiff. The simplest answer is often the right answer. <clears throat> Half the questions on the verdict form are defenses, right? There is no way to keep this. I have to give you evidence on every one of those defenses. There's no way for us to keep it simple. With simple cases, sticks a stick, just like in their documents, and a pack's a pack. That's simple. The revenue's the revenue. That's simple. But I can't leave it at that because of the defenses. So I apologize for that, but the co defenses complicated the case, and that's why I spend so much time on each of the defenses. Um, look, it's a lot of money, but we just wanted to stop. And he's supposed to have 1% of the stock. After signing Florida would be a 1% owner. They made it sound like he sold all the stock. No, no, no. The least possible so that he could pay everyone who was counting on him when he couldn't tour. The least possible. Well, he's still a major owner. And that's great. It's not quite $25 million, but it's still, he still owns a lot of that stock. But they didn't give him $25 million. They didn't pay him $25 million. They paid him in almost worthless stock that he believed, working together, they could make one day worth that much. And they were supposed to give him a 1% owner, a million, once those things were met. He trusted them to do it, and it never came. And when, it, when he had more time during the pandemic, and he needed the money, yes. He said, let me check about that stock. Um, am I a 1% owner? Let me check. And then they won't give him the data. So I wrote this down. There was no request ever for the data. Okay? To some extent, you have to look at the witnesses and say, well, somebody says there was, somebody says there wasn't. But there's one request for data that you know without a doubt, beyond the shadow of a doubt, which was the request that came from my law firm that went into evidence. The data. We want the data. Now, if they wouldn't get, and then you get a summary from a lawyer, from a defense lawyer. If they wouldn't provide the data then, how on earth is it reasonable to think that they provided the data earlier? And there's something incredibly interesting about that response on April 30th, 2021. I showed you all of the... It's 
uniform. There is not a single document you will ever find in Celsius referring to the, a box as a unit. I showed you a bunch where they refer to a stick as a unit. There's not a single one that says a box as a unit. So where did that come from? Right before they respond, a law firm responds, there's an email inside the company that says, how much flow fusion did we sell? The answer, 150. I showed you this in my closing just a minute. It's defendant 67. 151,100 tubs, 1,985,000 sticks. How much flow fusion did we sell? Whatever I said on tubs, sorry, I don't remember, 151,000. And a million nine six. That's the answer. That's the unit. It's always uniform. So where did this boxes thing come from? The first time you'll ever see boxes is from a lawyer letter that takes that because it's over six hundred and ninety thousand and divides it by fourteen. And suddenly that's the unit for the very first time in plaintiff's exhibit eight years. That's the only piece of evidence anywhere that a unit is a box. And I don't have time right now, but uh, there is so many documents, not only referring to a single uh, as a stick, as a unit, but referring to the box as a display. Uh, plane is 256, if you want to look at this, plane is 22, plane, defendant's 238, defendant's 231, defendant's 67, defendant's 125, display, display, display. It's meant to be displayed by the cash register. That's in, the, in Celsius' own documents before the lawyers were involved. The box is a display. The stick is the unit. Now, yes, it gets complicated because they say it's not a stick. So I have to say, yeah, but even if it's not a stick, we still sold 690,000 boxes. They, they, right, they get credit for on the million smart decisions they made. But you believed in the company, you believed in the people, and they were working together. And yes, that occurred in 2019 on the boxes. I don't think you even need to get there because there is not a single piece of evidence anywhere in Celsius documents that a box is the unit. It's always the stick. It has to be the stick. You will never, you could spend five years going through the documents. Juries aren't allowed to deliberate for five years. But, uh, <laughs> There, you'll never not find a single one referring to it that way. But because of their defenses, yes, it was 2019 when they sold enough boxes. But ironically, that paragraph has no deadline. The other one does. It has to mean something. One of them has to be during the term, the other one doesn't. And by the way, they say they took the label off at some point. Before they sold Flow Fusion, I don't know where it is, but you know what it looks like. Before they sold Flow Fusion, they did sell some powder products, totally different formula. Flow Fusion was a hit in the singles, and they never changed the formula, only the box. Still today, you go in there, you're buying the formula, you develop with them. Uh, they say, uh, D3M wrote this. That's the first time you heard that in closing. I'm glad it was said, because I should have. And smart enough to think about this. It says that at the top, you might think D3M wrote this. Right? So then all the terms are with, well, but if they wrote it, they know what a unit is. <laughs> so that's what just now. But uh, the fact is, they didn't write this. It was jointly done. That's why I should be that what I call the switcheroo was added in. How do we know for sure that this wasn't written by them? You have Plaintiffs 48, which is the Emerson Fittipaldi contract. Nothing to do with D3M, nothing to do with Flow Rida. And if you look under the agreement, paragraph one, term. Paragraph one for fit term. Paragraph two, engagement is <coughs> exclusivity. Same with fit Paragraph three, endorsement of products. Paragraph four, advertising and promotion. Paragraph five, non disclosure, non solicitation. Exact same. Celsius is using with totally different people. So it's not D3M wasn't writing contracts for Celsius. It's just not true that D3M wrote this. Uh, Andre, slide 40. Uh, council brought up uh, clause in the 
the royalty clause in the 2016 agreement. And I'm glad he did. Because when they're talking about boxes, they use the word boxes. A box is a box, a unit is a unit. The royalty of $100,000 is a small amount compared, it's not a small amount, but compared to the other things at issue, it is. Because we're limiting just the sparkling orange. Just trying to keep this simple. I, mean, I, I did a, as much as I could to simplify things. I feel like it would be legal malpractice for me not to respond to the defense. And yes, that's why this is so complicated. I hope my overview at the beginning explained where everything fit. But um, I, the, the royalty thing, I'm really trying to simplify. I can show you all the numbers. They're in evidence. Um, you have the calculations. It adds up to, I think, 123000 Why that amount? We took out all the flow fusion. We took out everything. It's just sparkling orange for a certain time frame. But the principle of it is, if we insist that it doesn't say during the term, and that's not in there, it has to mean something. By principle, he goes out, brands this, negotiates for that, no deadline, just like in the music industry, it has to mean something. Um, they just said that they paid all this money for him to promote the product, which is different than co-brand. Can you pull up um, slide 11, please? If anyone thinking or says in deliberations, they paid him $25 million, that's not fair. And if anyone says, this is too much money, that's not right. He's supposed to be a 1% owner in the company. Those benchmarks are met. Just issue the stock. But they refuse for whatever reason. So we have to come in here and ask for these numbers. Because if he has to buy the stock, that's what it costs. Um, anyway, uh, slide 11. This is from the 2014 contract. Company shall use such right of publicity only in association with the products. Remember what products? The fine term, co-branded. It is not true they're allowed to just go out and put him in ads with cans and things. Only on products and sales of products are included in the benchmark. Uh, slide, the new slide, Andre, with the new document. I don't know what it is. 43, maybe? So they just showed you this, okay? Now this was put in evidence this morning, right? So no witnesses testified about it. And it has some blanks in it. I, I, they actually blew up um, a different column where it's the singles don't have uh, something written under Celsius item code. But the year before it did, right? The one that was actually put in the evidence in this case. Now why is that blank? I don't know why it's blank. But I noticed something else is blank too, which is unit cost. If unit cost was filled in, you could just do the math and say, the unit cost is about a buck, it's a stick. If it's not about a buck, it's not a stick. But that's missing too. So you can't do that calculation. One minute. Thank you, Your Honor. A lot simpler. The stock wasn't trading so high, but it is. And if he was a one percent owner, like it says in the documents, like the deal's supposed to be, like once the sticks were sold, look, they could come in and say the stock's high. That's why he wants the stock. But I think it's pretty believable. He testified it was a generational thing for him and his kids. Maybe that's why they don't want to give them the stock. Maybe that's the reason why we're here. The, the price went up, and that's why they won't give it to them. The first time they asked for the analysis, they did it for the first time. It was owed. The lawyer changes stick to box as the definition of unit because they don't want to give the stock now that his vision came true. And they really did build something out of a local company, a tiny local company about to go out of business. Thank you. Members of the jury.
Um, you have now heard all of the evidence, my instructions on the law that you must apply in reaching your verdict, and the closing arguments of the attorneys. You will shortly retire to the jury room to decide this case. Before you do so, I have a few last instructions for you. During deliberations, jurors must communicate about the case only with one another and only when all jurors are present in the jury room. You will have in the jury room all of the evidence that was received during the trial. In reaching your decision, do not do any research on your own or as a group. Do not use dictionaries, the internet, or any other reference materials. Do not investigate the case or conduct any experiments. Do not visit or view the scene of any event involved in this case or look at maps or pictures on the internet. If you happen to pass by the scene, do not stop or investigate. All jurors must see or hear the same evidence at the same time. Do not read, listen to, or watch any news accounts of this trial. You are not to communicate with any person outside the jury about this case. Until you have reached a verdict, you must not talk about this case in person or through the telephone, writing, or electronic communication, such as a blog, Twitter, email, text message, or any other means. Do not contact anyone to assist you, such as a family accountant, doctor, or lawyer. These communication rules apply until I discharge you at the end of the case. If you become aware of any violation of these instructions or any other instruction that I have given in this case, you must tell me by giving a note to the bailiff. Any notes you have taken during the trial may now be taken to the jury room for use during your discussions. Your notes are simply an aid to your own memory, and neither your notes nor those of any other juror are binding or conclusive. Your notes are not a substitute for your own memory or that of other jurors. Instead, your verdict must result from the collective memory and judgment of all jurors based on the evidence and testimony presented during the trial. At the conclusion of the trial, the bailiff will collect your notes. They will be turned over to me. They will be shredded and immediately destroyed. No one will ever read your notes. In reaching your verdict, do not let bias, sympathy, prejudice, public opinion, or any other sentiment for or against any party to influence your decision. Your verdict must be based on the evidence that has been received and the law on which I have instructed you. Reaching a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. And you should not guess what I think your verdict should be from something that I may have said or done. You should not think that I prefer one verdict over another. Therefore, in reaching your verdict, you should not consider anything that I have said or done except for my specific instructions to you. Pay careful attention to all of the instructions that I gave you, for that is the law that you must follow. You will have a copy of my instructions with you when you go to the jury room to deliberate. All of the instructions are important, and you must consider all of them together. There are no other laws that apply to this case, and even if you do not agree with these laws, you must use them in reaching your decision in this case. When you go to the jury room, the first thing you should do is choose a presiding juror to act as a foreperson during your deliberations. The foreperson four person should see to it that your discussions are orderly and that everyone has a fair chance to be heard. It is your duty to talk with one, one another in the jury room and to consider the views of all of the jurors. Each of you must decide the case for yourself but only after you have considered the evidence with the other members of the jury. Feel free to change your mind if you are convinced that your position should be different. You should all try to agree, but do not give up your honest beliefs just because the others think differently. Keep an open mind so that you and your fellow jurors can easily share ideas about the case. I will give you a verdict form with questions that you must answer. I have already instructed you on the law that you are to use in answering these questions. You must follow my instructions and the form carefully. You must consider each question separately. Please answer the questions in the order they appear. After you answer a question, the form tells you what to do next. I will now read the form to you. At the top of the case is the uh, case style in the Circuit Court of the 17th Judicial Circuit in and for Broward County, Florida. 
Case number CAC 21-8997, Strong Arm Productions USA, Inc., Tremar Dillard, uh, PK Flo uh, Florida, and D3M Licensing Group, LLC. Plaintiffs, versus Celsius Holdings, Inc., Defendant. Verdict, we the jury find as follows. Count one, breach of 2014 agreement and prends a bonus compensation provision, $250,000 shares. I'm sorry, 250,000 shares, excuse me. One, did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius breached the 2014 agreement by establishing that Celsius achieved $1 million in gross cumulative co-branded revenues in any 12-month period during the term? And there's a place to check either yes or no. If your answer to question one is no, then your verdict is for the defendant on this claim and you should skip to question nine. If your answer to question one is yes, then continue to question two. <coughs> question two, on what date did Celsius breach this provision of the 2014 agreement? And there's a place to put a date. Question three, did the plaintiffs prove that the term of the 2014 agreement was ex extended by the 2016 agreement? Again, just place a check either yes or no. Four, did the defendant prove that the plaintiffs waived their right to compensation from Celsius under this provision of the 2014 agreement? And again, there's a place to check either yes or no. If your answer to question four is yes, then your verdict is for defendant on this claim and you should skip to question nine. If your answer to question four is no, then continue to question five. Question five, did the plaintiff prove that the breach of this provision of the 2014 agreement occurred before May 4th, 2016. Again, there's a place to check either yes or no. If your answer to question five is yes, answer questions six and seven. If your answer to question five is no, then skip to question eight. Question six, did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius fraudulently concealed information relating to the breach of this provision? There's a place to check either yes or no. Question seven, did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius is equitably stopped from asserting the statute of limitations defense to the breach of this provision. Again, a place to check either yes or no. If your answer to question six and seven are both no, then your verdict is for the defendant on this claim, and you should skip to question nine. If you answer yes to question six or seven, then continue to question eight. Question eight, what are the plaintiff's damages as a result of the breach of this provision? And there's a place to put an amount. Question nine, this is under count one, breach of 2014 agreement, and friends, incentive compensation provision, 500,000 shares. Question nine, did the plaintiffs prove that, the, that Celsius breached the 2014 agreement by establishing that Celsius sold a total of 690,000 units of co-branded product through its channels of distribution following the execution of this agreement? And there's a place to check either yes or no. If your answer to question nine is no, then your verdict is for the defendant and on this claim, and you should skip to question 17. Uh, if your answer to question nine is yes, then continue to question 10. Question 10, on what date did Celsius breach this provision of the 2014 agreement? And there's a place to put a date. Question 11, did the plaintiffs prove that with respect to units of co-branded products, an individual stick counts as a unit? And there's a place to check either yes or no. Question 12. Did the defendant prove that the plaintiffs waived their right to compensation from Celsius under this provision of the 2014 agreement? There's a place to check either yes or no. If your answer to question 12 is yes, then your verdict is for defendant on this claim, and you should skip to question 17. If your answer to question 12 is no, then continue to question 14. Question 13. Did the defendant prove that the breach of the 2014 agreement occurred before May 4th, 2016? There's a place to check either yes or no. And if your answer to question 13 is yes, then answer questions 14 and 15. If your answer to question 13 is no, then skip to question 16. All right, question 14. Did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius fraudulently concealed information relating to the breach of this provision? And there's a place to check either yes or no. Question 15. Did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius is equitably stopped from asserting the statute of limitations defense to the breach of this provision? 
place to check either yes or no. If your answer to questions 14 and 15 are both no, then your verdict is for the defendant on this claim, then you should skip to question 17. If your answer to if you answer yes to questions uh, 14 or 15, then continue to question 16. Question 16. What are the plaintiff's damages as a result of the breach of this provision? Um, continue to question 17. This has to do with the uh, count two breach of the 2016 agreement. Question 17. Did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius breached the 2016 agreement by failing to pay royalties under section 5.3 after October 11, 2018? It's a place to check either yes or no. Um, if your answer to question 17 is no, then your verdict is for defendant on this claim, and you should skip to questions eight and you should skip questions 18 and 19. If your answer to question 17 is yes, then continue to question 18. Question 18: Did the defendant prove that plaintiffs waived their right to additional compensation from Celsius under section 5.3 of the 2016 agreement? There's a place to check either yes or no. If your answer to question 18 is yes, then your verdict is for the defendant on this claim, and you, sh you should skip to question 19. If your answer to question 18 is no, then continue to question 19. Question 19, what are the plaintiff's damages as a result of the breach of the 2016 agreement? And there's a place to put an amount, and then the four person should sign and date the verdict form. So say we all, and there's a four person place to put the date, to sign the verdict form and place the date. Your verdict must be unanimous. That is, your verdict must be agreed to by each of you. When you have agreed on your verdict, your four person must write the date and sign it at the bottom and return the verdict to the bailiff. If any of you need to communicate with me for any reason, write me a note and give it to the bailiff. In your note, do not disclose any vote or split. All right, before I send you out, let me see if you up your sidebar. This is the toughest part of my job, and that is uh, letting the alternates know they're alternates. And so, uh, um, unfortunately, the law does not allow all of you to go back to deliberate. It's only the six that are selected, and we have two alternates. Um, I will start by saying that if, uh, um, first of all, in federal court, they don't have alternates. They just have a, a range of jurors. And so, unfortunately, in state court, it's different. So we do have alternates. But the role of the alternate is extremely important. If we did not have alternates and something had come up, if somebody got sick or there's been an emergency or whatnot, if we didn't have an alternate, we'd have to start all over again. And obviously, we would not want to do that. So I do want to thank you. Um, and our alternates are Portia Rice and Trisha Korzanowski. And so you are our two alternates. You can go ahead and stay there for right now. Um, but again, I wanted to publicly thank you in front of everyone and, and thank you for your time and your service. Um, a few things. You are welcome to stick around to see what the jury does. Um, or also, if you want, you can just head right out the door and leave and don't look back. Uh, the other thing is, if you like, you're, you're more than welcome to talk to anybody. Um, but 
flip side, if you don't want to talk to anybody, you don't have to. That will be left up to you, okay? Um, the next thing I was going to ask, do you have anything in the jury room? No? Okay. Because um, once they send the jurors back, you're not allowed to go back in there. So I want to make sure that you don't have anything back there. Okay. All right. So at this time, members of the jury, we now retire to deliberate. Um, on the way back, um, we are going to collect any electronic devices for um, obvious reasons that we don't want any appearance of variety. So we're going to collect any electronic devices. Um, at this time, bring your notes back with you. We are going to organize, organize all the exhibits here. And we're going to send back a set of the instructions as well as a verdict form and all of the exhibits. And so at this point, um, we now retire to deliberate and to report when uh, your lunches are back there as well. So uh, here's the other thing. We, um, I do need to give my staff and everybody a lunch break as well. So we're going to send you back and we're going to take a lunch break. All right. So if you do have a question or anything, we don't get back to you right away. It's because we're at lunch. All right. And so with that, we now retire and deliberate. Um, all right, um, Ms. Korsnowski and uh, Ms. Rice, if you want to stay there, I do have certificates for you. I'm going to bring those out to present to you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're going to try and get everything all organized here first, okay? So if you want to just hang in there for a few minutes. All right, let the record reflect the jury's outside of presence. So I do need to make sure that you're all in agreement as to the exhibits that go back there. Um, I do have the uh, instructions. I, I did have one thing I was going to point out. I don't know if you want to fix it on the instructions. If you look at page 17 on the avoidance for uh, fraudulent concealment. Yes. If you look at the elements, it has the and after element four. The and should be after element five. Um, do you want me to hand write that in? Or do you I'm want okay to? with that. Yes, that's fine. Okay. You should get it now. All right, so I've done that. So I'm going to have you look at the instructions, look at the exhibits. You can print out a new uh, verdict form. Um, before uh, we break, I, first of all, I want to commend all the attorneys um, for your professionalism. I thought uh, you all were extremely professional, and I always appreciate that. So thank you, as, as well as the parties as well. I thought the parties were extremely professional as well. And so um, I thought, also the attorneys, I thought you all did an excellent job for your respective sides. Uh, um, I had no idea, obviously, what the jury is going to do, but I thought your attorneys did an excellent job for both sides. So um, Mr. Dillard, um, Mr. Uh, Gold, and Mr. Sandifer, Sandifer, I'm not sure who else is here. Um, again, I thought your attorneys did an excellent job. Uh, this is a difficult case. And so uh, now the jury is uh, hands down. So uh, with that, um, there is one more quick thing. Okay. The USB drive, um, we object to that uh, going back. If the jurors want to see videos, obviously we don't have a problem with that, but the USB drive has active open Excel spreadsheets and stuff like that. I don't think that's what's intended uh, by putting the USB in the jury room. All right. Um, yeah, I've got to instruct the jury that if they want to see any, any objections, just have one of my bill the exhibits back to let them know that if they want to see anything on the thumb drive, to just send a note out, we'll bring them back in and play it here. Agreed? I agree. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. And the only outstanding issue was the Celsius heat cans. Um, remember that those were not supposed to go back, or we had an issue <coughs> as to that. As to that, I think that's accurate. I think the cans right. themselves, you mean? The, right, the cases of the Celsius heat, especially because those aren't the same Celsius heat. Uh, can we maybe? Okay, those that's fine. We all agree. I'm not going to get annoyed. So. Right, and, and the, I'm sorry. And the packets. It was both the cans, and I think there was a Celsius heat box. So it was all the Celsius heat stuff wasn't supposed to go back there. Okay. So we'll go ahead and pull those out. And then, uh, all right. So. Um, all right. We're going to be on a lunch break then. So let's say for about an hour. If um, you are not going to be back here, right outside the door. Please leave a cell phone where we can call and get you back here right away. Just in case, obviously, if there's a verdict, but also in case there's a question. All right? So we'll be in recess for an hour for lunch, and then uh, and we'll be in recess until we hear from the jury. Thank you.